Welcome to the um, Committee of Council meeting for Wednesday, April the 3rd. All members except uh, Councillor Hakirth Singh uh, are present today. Uh, and uh, so we shall begin with the uh, approval of the agenda. Does anybody have anything to add or subtract to Councillor Santos? Yeah, I think it's <laughs> Councillor, or sorry, Mayor Brown. Okay, if we can add an item at uh, 13.3, which is for security of property negotiation um, matter for in camera. So, Mr. Chair, that would be identified as item 13.3, security of the property of the municipality or local board, and a position, plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on buyer on behalf of the municipality or local board. So there's no other uh, speakers, and so Councilor Medeiros, would like to move approval of the agenda? Sure. All in favor? That carries. Um, are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Seeing none, uh, we move on to consent. Does anybody want to move? Sorry, uh, Mayor Brown. I'd like to add to the consent agenda 9.22. Uh, that is with the staff recommendation to uh, waive the fees. That's uh, the Easter Seals event where they asked to use a facility that uh, wasn't in use. Okay. So do you want to move uh, approval of the agenda? Mayor Brown? I, that's added to the consent agenda, yeah. Oh, sorry, we got to approve consent agenda. Um, so, so is it, sorry, we got uh, Councillor Pileshi. It's actually Councillor Williams. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, through you, Mr. Chair, the um, seating assignment is mixed up and that'll be corrected momentarily. So, who's on there? You want Councillor Williams? Okay, so, uh, um, yes, Councillor Williams. Yeah, do you, do I have a question about 8.2.5 in the consent item? to 8.2.5, 8.2.5, which is a request to begin procurement to replace Countryside Drive Bridge over the West Humber Tributary and three pedestrian bridges over Ravenswood Park, Maitland Park, and Stephen Llewellyn Park. Do you want to pull that out of consent and speak about it later? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, 8.2.5. Can you hear me now? Is the volume Barely. higher? Barely. No? Can, can we move the... Uh... <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> oh, I got some right here if you want to <laughs> share. So we'll try to speak loud until we fix the, uh, the volume issue. So uh, just to give you a recap, we... Um, We did the approval of the agenda. We wanted to see if anybody wanted to add or delete anything. Uh, we did a declaration uh, of conflict of interest. There was no conflicts. Uh, we have a consent agenda. So uh, items that are considered routine, um, those are uh, approved at the beginning uh, of the uh, meeting. Uh, and if somebody wants to add something to consent or remove something, um, they're able to do that. And so we took out uh, a couple of items out of consent, uh, and so we're going to have a discussion on those. And so that's where we are right now. Uh, and what we're going to do uh, is approve the uh, consent, uh, sorry, we're going to get approval for consent agenda, right? So, um, Councilor Fertini, uh, you want to move uh, the consent agenda? So all in favor? Uh, that, that, is, uh, uh, that carries. 
So, so sorry, through you, Mr. Chair, just to clarify that you added um, the request from the Mayor Brown yes. with waiving the fees, and then there was one item pulled from consent from Council. Oh, yeah, we added that and we, we, we pulled one. Um, there's no announcements uh, today, we're, so we're going to move on to the delegations. Uh, and so we have a few people coming to, to delegate today, and so uh, we're going to start with uh, 5.1, which is a uh, delegation from the United Way 2018 campaign uh, check presentation. Uh, so we have Roxanne Van Dam, Cindy Tate, uh, and unfortunately uh, Danielle Zanati is not here today, but uh, we do have uh, Anita Stalinga. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair, Mayor Brown, and members of Council. Thank you very much for including us today on today's agenda to talk about the City of Brampton's United Way campaign. Um, I'm wondering if we can ask for slightly longer than five minutes, just because we have a photo op at the end, if that's would so be it's, a... uh, it's already moved by it. So it's moved by Councillor Bowman. All in favor? So you do have an extension. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Roxanne Van Dam. I, I'm chair of the United City of Brampton's 2018 campaign. Joining me today is Cindy Tate. She's on this side, sorry. Uh, chair of the City of 2019 campaign. And Anita Stalinga, Regional Executive, GTA Integration of United Way of Greater Toronto. I want to extend... I'm move this ahead. A huge thank you to City Council, the campaign core team, and our ambassadors and champions across the city for all the hard work they put into our 2018 campaign. City of Brampton staff put in huge efforts through participating in over 22 different fundraising events and volunteering at all those events. And today I am proud to announce that in 2018, uh, the City of Brampton staff raised 145000 $55.22, and also collected over 8,932 pounds of food and toys, all donated to United Way. These donations help fund over 200 agencies across the greater Toronto area, with more than 50 agencies in Brampton and Peel alone, which help fight poverty in our community and provide support for everyone close to home. Thank you and congratulations, team. And our current 2019 chair, Cindy Tate, would like to say a few words about the upcoming 2019 campaign. Thank you very much, Roxanne. Chair, Mayor Brown, members of council. It is my absolute pleasure to be able to announce to you what our fundraising goal will be for the 2019 campaign. We're aiming high, and I'm confident we'll make it at 150,000. So far, we've completed two events, the Dress Down Pass sales beginning end of January into February, as well as our really exciting, fun, curling fun spiel that wrapped up on March 23rd, where we are excited to see members of council and Mayor Brown join us, as well as many city teams. Coming up in our year of events, we're bringing back the Living on the Edge Poverty Simulator that is booked for April 26th at Century Gardens two years ago when the City of Brampton staff participated in that. There was a huge impact made on staff where they were able to experience firsthand what it felt like to be someone living in poverty and having to experience the challenges it takes to navigating the system. We're also participating as well this year with, once again, the um, National Public Works Week bus pull on May 23rd by doing our food festival. We encourage members of staff, senior management here, and of course, council to come by and not only cheer on the teams in the bus pull, but to have something, a bite to eat and support the United Way that way. We'll be extending days of caring, which are opportunities for staff to, to go out to agencies in the Peel area, hopefully Brampton, but as well Mississauga and Caledon, where they can donate some of their time to help those nonprofits, and an agency bus tour where we're going to be extending out as well for additional opportunities for staff to participate. Always exciting. Well, we're going to have Great Wolf Lodge June and October. Details will be announced on our portal and in the spotlight. And our pledge barbecue kickoff is September 10th. 
Uh, bingo will be back September and October, so I encourage you, buy your tickets, help support our cause that way. And new this year, we're going to be recruiting teams to partner up with Greater Toronto doing the UPS plane pull and the CN Tower climb. And wrapping up the year will be our silent auction at the end. I'd like to also introduce my vice chair, Richard Leach. Richard, do you want to come up here for a second? Richard is going to be participating in the sponsored employee program with United Way. He's going to be leaving us, helping me this year as vice chair, but leaving us September to December to work with United Way, and then coming back as next year's chair in 2020. Now I'd like to invite Anita Stalinga to say a few words on behalf of United Way Greater Toronto. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chair, Mayor Brown, and Council members and community members in the audience. It is such a fantastic honour to celebrate with you the incredible achievement that you've had through the United Way campaign. Um, this is fantastic and we are so pleased that we're able to support our local community right here in Brampton um, with uh, programs and services that are available across the city for people to access, especially those who are vulnerable and in need. I wanted to extend uh, special thanks to Mayor Brown, CAO Joe Pitari, and the entire senior executive team, and both employee campaign chairs, Roxanne Van Dam and Cindy Tate and Peter, for their volunteer support, their hard work, their dedication and commitment to support our community, and Jane Holmes, who has been part of the United Way for a number of years and has been providing fantastic leadership and support to our campaign. The numbers are impressive. But we also know that the numbers in our community around need are also significant and stark and startling. And we want to make sure that United Way is here to support those that are vulnerable. Children here in Brampton uh, live in higher rates of poverty than adults and seniors. And we are extremely concerned about that. And for that reason, we are investing quite heavily in supports for children and youth and family members across the city so that they can access services when they need them in times of need. We fund 88 programs across the region of Peel, and 70, 73 of those programs were accessed by Brampton residents. And that indicates the significant amount of pressures and challenges and vulnerabilities that people and families are facing. And we're proud to be part of that community infrastructure to ensure that that support remains in our community. It is exactly a year ago that we merged, that United Way of Peel Region merged with United Way Toronto and York Region to create United Way Greater Toronto. And I can tell you that our commitment to support our community has never been stronger. We are here, fiercely local, ensuring that the support to our agencies and to our families continues, and that we maintain that level of funding that we have been investing in our community, and look for ways to grow and increase that support. And as, as examples, we can point to some of the research work that we are going to be releasing shortly that includes data on Peel Region about income inequality and the impact of that across our region and the vulnerabilities, the increasing vulnerabilities that people will face as a result of that. We continue our work with our community advisory councils, particularly our black, South Asian, and Chinese community advisory councils. And during Black History Month, we were the proud recipients from the City of Brampton and Mayor Brown's awards, recognizing our work in supporting the black community. We're also co-chairs of the Peel Poverty Reduction Committee, and we are home to the Peel Newcomer Strategy Group right here uh, in the region of Peel. So I wanted to thank you for all of that because that is only possible because of the wonderful campaign support that you provide us so that we can invest it back into our local communities. I wanted to thank former councillor lead Gail Miles for her support and at the same time welcome Doug Willens for 2019 for his leadership and support. Roxanne Van Dam was a great chair for us. She was a former sponsored employee, which means she worked with us on the campaign for 16 weeks, as did Cindy Tate last year, and both were phenomenal leaders. And we welcome um, the support again this year. Um, and in closing, I would like to uh, thank you again and uh, look forward to working with you in partnership with the City of Brampton with council, with our community partners, to ensure that no one is left behind and that we are here, fiercely local, with community, supporting our vulnerable but residents in times of need. Thank you for everything that you do. Okay.
Thank you, Anita. And now we'd just like to invite uh, Mayor Brown, Count City Council, and our campaign core team to take a picture with the big check from 2018 for the final um, photo op. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, now move on to. Oh, sorry, we do have speakers on uh, on the board, and so Councillor Willens. Yeah, thank you through you, Chair. Thank you, Cindy <coughs> and Roxanne. Uh, wherever they went, I guess they left. <laughs> Get back to work. But uh, we had a curling bond spilled. It was a blast. Uh, I encourage all council members next year to get involved. I know that our clerk was there, Peter Faye, supporting it, and some other staff members. It was a lot of fun. So this is a. Uh, a great cause, and uh, again, thank you to all the staff and, um, for putting this on. And the old mayor was there as well, yeah. I think our team actually beat the mayor's team, actually. So, Thanks, Councillor Santos. You took yourself off and put you back on. Um, thank you through you, Chair, and to all the staff as well who were here and also uh, listening. This is just another example of how our staff go above and beyond the call of duty, um, not just to serve the city, but also our community. So a huge thanks uh, to all the staff who were involved in this year's uh, fundraising efforts for the United Way. Thank you, uh, Councilor Santos. Do you want to move receipt of the delegation? All in favor? Council Medeiros, all in favor? Thank you. Carries. <laughs> so we're going to move on to 5.2, which is a delegation from Akeem Gardner and uh, Randy Ose from Atlas 365 in regards to sustainable building materials. Welcome. Hello. Hello, Chair, Mayor Brown, fellow members of City Council. My name is Akeem Gardner of Atlas 365, my business partner, Randy Ose. And today I want to share with you guys how cannabis can be one of our secret weapons in Brampton's 2040 vision. Um, my presentation is going to go slightly over five minutes. Can I ask for a few more minutes to speak? Can I change slides with this one? Yes. Okay, thank you. So to start, I want to introduce you guys. This is my niece, Naya. She's two years old. She was born right here in Brampton. In the year 2050, she'll be 33 years old. But she, like many of our other children, won't be able to afford her house in Brampton. And I want to tell you why. $43 billion. This is how much insurance companies are expecting to pay out due to property damage, due to severe weather, by the year 2050. With this in mind, insurance companies are expected to raise home insurance premiums 2 to 4% annually, 
that can uh, result in premiums that can cost up to 94000 by the year 2050. If we take into account yes yesterday's federal government report about the rate at which Canada is, is warming, these um, ex expectations, they seem to be conservative. It could be a lot more than this. Worse, we're self-inflicting this on ourselves as our buildings, homes, and the construction industry all continue to be a leading uh, industry emitter for greenhouse gases here in Ontario today. All this begs the question, how do we solve this problem before it's too late? Well, we're at Atlas 365, and we're developing a complete, sustainable, concrete alternative for developers to be used in residential, commercial, and industrial properties. This building material is twice as strong as, and resilient as traditional building materials, and also reduce the environmental and economic burdens attached to new property development. This raw material grows right on, the, on our farms. This raw material is called industrial hemp. Um, at the bottom left, you, uh, you can see a picture of the Just Biofiber block. I'll take you through it. On the top, top left, you can see the first house built in Souk, British Columbia. Um, it's called the Harmless Home. So to start, I want to talk to you a little bit about the difference between hemp and its more famously known cousin, marijuana or weed. Hemp doesn't get you high, can't get you high, but instead it's grown for industrial and commercial purposes, used for things like food, rope, clothing, and building materials. As a matter of fact, hemp has a rich history in humanity. It can be traced back as far as 800 BC um, to China, where it was used for textiles and fabrics. Our company grows hemp north of Brampton and with the hemp of many um, local farmer, uh, many farmers in Ontario, one of which from Barrie, Ontario, he's in the crowd, um, to represent all of our Ontario farmers. We all grow hemp together because we know um, what this will do for us in, our future, in the future development of um, Ontario and of Canada. With the help of our partners in Calgary, Alberta, we can manufacture this hemp into the Just Biofiber block, a factory formed interconnecting block that is a complete construction solution for external or internal walls. Benefits of this block include the fact that it's carbon neutral, it's easy to install, no skilled labor is required, and it has an R32 insulation va value, increasing the energy efficiency of our buildings and our homes. In fact, the Canadian Green Building Council, to which we're a member of, awarded this product, uh, product of the year runner-up in 2018. The block has passed all of its testing and certifications. It's building code compliant for properties up to four stories tall thus far and it has superior performance attributes, especially when we compare it to the more commonly used precast concrete, uh, concrete block or the concrete masonry unit. Much better for strength and resiliency of our buildings. The added bonus is also cheaper. What does this mean? Um, when we look at our homes, we can save up to 48% of the cost in residential houses um, it's 48% 48 of the cost of the building materials for residential homes, sorry, and will also provide better energy efficiencies than we have in our homes now. If we look at our hospitals, assuming Williams Ulster was built entirely of precast concrete, we would have saved over $3 million Canadian if we used this as a concrete alternative. We only need to look at Brampton's projected growth to see why it's important that we start to future-proof our investments into the built environment. I also want to point out that this project is being pioneered by us in Brampton, for us in Brampton. This is where we learned all of our key, uh, our key skills of how to build a team and how important a collaboration is to the success of any goal and mission. When we reach full capacity, our manufacturing plant will employ full, will have over 70 full-time jobs, which we intend to house right here in Brampton. We also intend to utilize Brampton's young, educated workforce to further develop the industry with innovations like what you see on the right, the hemp brick that can store electricity right inside of it. What this means is that in the future of housing, we can possibly have units that have solar panels on the roof, 
um, and store energy right in our walls, reducing the needs for external grids and saving um, energy, uh, energy costs in our homes and our buildings. Oh, sorry. Now uh, we can't get there alone. This is why um, individuals like David Lang and the Institute for, Sustainable, uh, Institute for Sustainability Brampton are so important for young companies like us. We need their help just like we need yours. But what I'm most excited about, about all, in all this is how the built environment are gonna impact our future and our current citizens. So studies have shown that green buildings increase cognitive function of those inside them up to 101%. Growing up around vegetation decreased the risk of mental health disorders in adulthood by up to 55%. So can you imagine what our children will be like when we build our future homes and schools up to these standards? We should aim to find out, just like this school in Quebec is doing. After all, the first 2,000 days uh, of life are the most critical, as this is when 90% of the human brain is developed. Further, I want to add to this how this affects our citizens right now. As our population continues to age, as we need, will have the need for more um, elderly homes, uh, elderly homes, advanced care homes. The green buildings will have the same effects on cognitive performing performance of our aging citizens as it will for our, our young. So today we're here to ask Brampton to start future proving, proofing our investments into the city by prioritizing sustainability, resilience, and environmental impact into our building code. This is very similar to what other cities around the world are doing, cities like Toronto, Montreal, Barcelona, New York, so on and so forth. We also want to ask Brampton to support our vision so we can continue to help Brampton emerge as a leader in the new low carbon economy. This is important because visions like ours cannot happen, happen alone. The threat we face is way too big for any one organization to tackle on their own. But with your help and the help of our many other stakeholders, we know that we can make Brampton a key player in the role of a, de a sustainably developed Canada. Uh, and create a more resilient world for, t for tomorrow and our future citizens. Thank you. So we do have a do couple of speakers. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to go to uh, Councillor Willens. Thank you, Akeem, for coming in. Uh, we had a nice talk in the office, so I guess about a month ago or so. Mm -hmm. um, the Ontario market for hemp in in 2009, it was about 106 acres, I think, something like that. I think mm -hmm. it's in 2011, they reported there was over 1,400 acres. Now, do you know what that market is now? I think last year we did just over 1,600 acres. Okay. So we are missing some gaps, but that's why individuals like ourselves started to grow hemp as well, so we can add to that acreage. Now, you're using, you're producing the herd right at your farm yep. now? Pardon? You're producing the herd now at your farm? So we're producing the full plant, okay. which includes the herd, the fiber, and also the flowers, which are used for medicinal purposes. No so, THC, you can't get hemp. So the company out west, is, is it Manitoba Harvest? Is that one of the ones that does it? Manitoba Harvest is in Manitoba. They produce seeds from their hemp, but seeds. again, they grow the whole flower. I think, they, I think their market was estimated in 2011 about $15 million, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I think? Yeah. Okay, there's one thing you did forget to mention. I know that the R value on that, you did mention about greenhouse gases, but actually there's been some studies done by a couple of authors. Chris Magwood, I think, is one of the guys that writes about sustainable buildings. He was the first guy to build at a bale house, I think, in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And he's actually um, building at Trent University. They're building their new forensic science department out of the Just Biofiber block. He's the one who has that contract. I did his hempcrete building class up in Peterborough, Ontario, as well. I think there's also some, some studies done that there's actually negative uh, zero footprint. They mm -hmm. can get actually going the other way. Mm -hmm. So that's great. It's glad you came in. Um, can you contact me later? Because uh, my son is actually on an interesting project in downtown Toronto. They're doing a, uh, it's a piece of land that they can't build on. No developer will touch it because it's too contaminated. So there's some gentlemen that have taken on the, uh, the, the vacant land and they're doing a sustainable um, pop-up. They're doing um, containers, much okay. like they do, like they use the container, shipping containers to build holes to do it for, yeah. uh, uh, I think it's doing retail shops, pop-up shops, but okay. he's actually been contracted to do the park, the landscaping benches, and he's looked at the hempcrete, 
Okay. But he's having problems finding the herd. He doesn't want to bring in 900 pounds from from, B, uh, from BC or whatever. Okay. So I'm just wondering maybe we can connect later and they can hook him up. For it's, sure. Uh, yep. It's going to be a showcase down in Toronto. So it's for sure. Almost sustainability. Okay. So thanks for coming in. Thank you. Councilor Santos. Thank you, through you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Akeem and Randy, for coming in today. I know that you have met with a number of us individually, and now you're presenting to everyone, um, including all of the staff who are here. So a couple of things. I just want to acknowledge the fact that there has been really, with our new council, an increase in youth engagement. You as young people, as entrepreneurs in our city, we're seeing more and more come to City Hall to pitch your ideas, share your creative ideas and solutions to big problems. And it's quite clear from Vision 2040 and your presentation today that our young people care about the environment, especially when it comes to the city in which they, they live in. Um, your ideas, when you came to present, I was super impressed. I'm super impressed with what you've done with this presentation here. And I will say to staff that, um, and you're going to laugh, this is even better than shipping containers. <laughs> okay, so mm -hmm. I would love to refer this delegation to staff for consideration as we look at the objectives of becoming a more sustainable community. And as when we look, and when we look at building materials for community, future community centers, libraries, various hubs of sorts, um, that we should be looking at these new technologies and take the charge um, and, and lead the way for other municipalities when it comes to ideas presented by our young people in particular. Um, so I am going to refer this to staff for, for consideration. Um, and I, I just want, that's, that's all really I had to say. Um, oh, actually, no, one other thing. So what I would, because you are young people and we value your contribution to the city, you shared with many of us kind of your story and how you got to this point with your business. We would love to hear so that the public can also hear and the young people can hear where you came from and now where you are as business owners. Okay. Right now? Yeah. A little bit. Okay. So how do we start? Well, we'll start with, yeah, so uh, I grew up in Brampton, went to St. Marguerite de Ville, and I got a scholarship to go play basketball at University of Ottawa, and after that I coached in basketball for a couple years at Ryerson University, um, but I realized that I didn't think I wanted to be a coach, I liked the general manager sort of um, proposition, so when I went on the MBA website, a lot of general managers went to law school, guess what, we're going to law school. And I decided to go to law school overseas in the UK. Um, while I was doing that, my business partner, Randy Ose, he started a, a sports management and entertainment company. We have a lot of talent, uh, NBA talent coming out of Brampton. When Anthony Bennett went number one, Randy was right there with him. And that's where Randy launched his company. When I got back in 2017, I started to notice um, differences in the environment. I was understanding what was going on in the legalization of cannabis a lot differently. And I knew Randy had, athlete, had athletes, we, so we had a little bit of leverage. I knew that there was um, a gap that could be filled because medical cannabis, or CBD, has, is good for pain, inflammation, um, reduction in brain injury, um, and could be really been, uh, helpful for our citizens, especially when we're looking at not using opioids, but using plant-based medicines. So I came to Randy and I said, hey, let's try to get use our athletes as spokespersons for the positive side of, of cannabis, not what everyone sees on urban TV and, um, and music videos. There's a real uh, responsible use story to be told. And that's what started us on this journey. From there, I learned about the hemp plant, which is different than marijuana, no THC much better for our athletes, much better for our environment, or for our citizens, much better for our environment. Then I started to learn much more and more about how we can, um, it contributes to sustainable fashion. The fibers use 20 times less water to grow than our cotton does, right? Um, the fashion industry is responsible for 7% of greenhouse gas emissions, much better for our athletes. Put on a nice hemp made sweater, athletes wear it to games, we get marketing. Then I learned that we can build with it zero carbon emission buildings, all the benefits of green buildings. What happens when individuals like us, um, we were waking up every day before and after school, spending our times at the YMCA, 
What if these were green buildings, uh, carbon negative buildings? What does that do for the benefit of our athlete? This is also easy for our athletes to get behind, right? Let's build our recreation centers from it, our libraries from it, our schools. Went, went on, um, kept on going, kept on going. Then I realized um, there was a lot of marijuana companies, a lot of licensed producers that were doing this, but they were only focused on the recreational side of cannabis. Uh, I said to Randy one day, why are we trying to give our athletes to them to increase their message? They don't really understand the social impact that this could have, but we do. So one day it just hit me. I was walking my dog and it hit me and I said, let's do something ourselves. I looked at the, um, the rules and regulations, what it took to do hemp, said that we just have to be a farmer. And I'm not a farmer, but it doesn't seem hard enough. I used to wake up in the morning, run suicides, uh, all the things that our athletes do. It's just hard work. So we decided to jump in. And then fortunately enough, while when after we jumped in, we met a lot of farmers in Ontario. Um, this is our team making abilities, uh, and they helped us out to understand the industry and how to farm, how to use the tractors, what we need to do, and all the different harvesting methods. Then with all that, we've been bringing it all together to try to find a way to sustainably do that. Um, Councillor Williams, you mentioned that there's only about 1,600 acres. The reason being is because the infrastructure here in Ontario isn't set up as it is in the prairie provinces. We still need a little bit of more work to do, but the advantage that we have is when I go out to Calgary, um, they talk about we have advanced manufacturing expertise, we have construction expertise, we have all these things going for us. So I figured that if we can harness these, we can really bring together a circular ecosystem, a zero waste ecosystem, and have a great impact because in Ontario, we're one of the leading causes uh, we're one of the leading uh, contributors to greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. So we need to have an impact here um, and learn from what they're doing in the rest of Canada and the rest of the world. your mentors to future generations as well. Thank you again for coming to present and I will move to refer this back to staff because it is better, even better than shipping containers. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Santos. Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you. Through you, Chair. This is, it's fascinating information. I know we know the history of hemp and how it was used for generations, but then with the stigma associated with marijuana over the years, it's turned into something that people stay away from. So it's really great to see it being brought back for um, how it was used um, historically. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have an actual um, like block. Do you have one in Brampton that you can bring with you to, to show people? And I do. Yeah, what is the weight of each block? It's very light. It's very light? Yeah, I can carry it and I can bring it to your office. Um, I have it in my car actually. I didn't want to bring it in today because it's a little bit messy. I've been dragging it around to oh. a lot of people. Yeah. So that's the only reason why I didn't bring it today. Mm -hmm. But I can bring it. Um, let's just say when I went to Calgary and I saw it for the first time, I told them that I had to bring it back. Yeah. And I was able to stick it in my carry-on and fly with it without paying an, overcharge, an overweight fee. Really? And for a block that size, if you can imagine if it was a cinder block, I wouldn't yeah. be able to carry it without breaking my back. So that's it's really good. I know my friends in the masonry industry would love to hear that it mm -hmm. doesn't break their back. Yes. <laughs> um, so when, how does, um, I know our climates can, can be a little bit harsh, so how does our climate here, and especially in, Brampton, in Ontario, some of our farmlands north of us, how would that impact the growth? The, the growth hemp, of the plant? The plant, yeah. Well, that's the other key thing about hemp, and the reason why I knew I could start with it. It's one of the most resilient crops that we have. Once you get it into the ground, it sort of, take cares of it takes care of itself. Like um, last year, where I grew up in, a little bit past Orangeville, we had a drought, didn't get a lot of rain. But when we did get rain, we saw it sprout and we got a really good crop. Um, hemp grows anywhere in the world in a variety of different circumstances. To um, Councillor Wayne's point, um, your son had, uh, your son, right? he has a property that he can't grow on because it's con contaminated. If we know in Chernobyl, Chernobyl they used to have a, uh, they had a, 
nuclear disaster there. That's right. And what they did is they planted hemp there and it sucked all the radiation out of the plant, okay. out of the ground. So now that they can go back and grow foods and that they can eat from. Um, <coughs> Environment Canada knows about these benefits, about how we can grow it to remediate our soils. Mm -hmm. And then we can use the byproducts of that for commercial uses, for biomaterials that are much safer for our environment than um, our plastics and some of the other uh, materials that we're, we're working with right now. So it's pretty sustainable, it's pretty resilient, even in to our, outdoor, uh, our outdoor environment. No. Okay, Do so you, it's not like you have to, it has to be canopied or some, um, something no. over it, it can just grow. It's not marijuana. Marijuana needs yeah. to be grown in a greenhouse. Okay. This is a cash crop that we grow on the farm. Okay. So I know the the um, the financial impact of marijuana being grown, like per certain, um, like the amount of space. And uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is, if you have like a like a half of a hockey rink, that would generate a certain amount of money um, from the cannabis sales. Does that also kind of translate? to hemp as well? Like, if you have a certain amount, like how much money would you yield from a, a harvest? I think that's what I'm trying to ask. It depends on the variety and it depends on the reason why you grow it. Yeah. There's certain varieties that are grown better for seed, there's certain varieties that are grown better for fiber, and there's certain varieties that are grown better for CBD, right? The key thing about hemp is that one, uh, whichever variety that you grow from, you can access all the markets. You just need to be able to process the plant the right way. There's zero waste, so every part of it can be sold. That's why it's the most profitable cash crop that we have. Okay, so can you break it down to like numbers? And uh, so if I had like a hockey arena, that size crop, how much would that generate? I don't know. Or half arena? an acre, how much would a half an acre generate? Can you put it to like an acre? Yeah. Um, if we grow the pretense that we're working on right now, and I'm only gonna talk about CBD okay. because that's what the, the, the legalization of cannabis is what's allowing us this to be a growing industry going forward because everyone wants the CBD, right? right? So I'll say on average, on average deal, the, um, an acre of hemp can be worth over $10,000 okay. just by selling the CBD or the flower to licensed producers. Okay. Our goal is to take those sales use that to fuel our industrial purposes, but also to have social impact to educate and create jobs in our community. Okay, so 10,000 per, per, per acre just for the CBD oil. You grow it the right way, minimum there. I mean, it can go a lot higher, but it will be conservative today. Okay, and how often do harvests happen? Is it once every three months or? Yep, it, takes, it grows between 90 and 120 days, so it's rapidly renewable. And in Ontario, we grow it after May 15th, before June 10th. We harvest it any time around April 31st, before October 1st. Again, it depends what you're growing for. Yeah. The fiber harvest comes first, the seed harvest later in the year, and then the high CBD is somewhere in the middle. Okay. Thank you for answering no my problem. question. It's been great. Thanks. Councillor Bowman. Thank you very much to you, Mr. Chair. You, you came here to talk about a sustainable product and we're talking agriculture now, which is fantastic. So, uh, and my question is more along the agricultural line as well for the product itself. 120 days from seed to, to harvest in some cases. Mm -hmm. So you could uh, technically possibly get a couple. If we have a, a good long summer and a, a warm fall, you can get a couple in. And is there a shortage of fields in Ontario to plant this in? No. Okay. So, in fact, um, and I read the 2016 Peel consensus, we have over 10,000 hectares in Peel alone. We can do this all here. What we don't have is the manufacturing or the processing equipment to allow our farmers to access all the markers. Uh, market, sorry. So an example, um, Tom Smith, he's up, the, up there. Tom Smith's from Barrie. Tom Smith has been selling the seed, but he has a hundred, over 100 bales of hemp, which include the fiber and the herd, sitting on his farm because there's no manufacturing equipment here today. So that's why that's our goal, to get the manufacturing equipment here to open up all the markets to all the farmers. Then we can have more farmers growing it without um, worrying about where they're gonna sell it to or who's gonna offtake it. 
the key is because now marijuana is legal, it's also impacted the hemp. Now we can sell the flower as well to make the plant even more valuable. Okay. And as far as cash crops go, um, is this, is this, does hemp have the potential to make some of the farmers look at it and say, I'm going to switch from soya beans, for example, to hemp? So we wouldn't switch from soybeans to hemp, not directly, because when hemp follows soybeans, it has the potential to mold. But after a few years, yes, um, it's the most valuable cash crop we have. We see a lot of tobacco farmers, especially in the United States, switching from tobacco to hemp. A lot of farmers that grow canola, I know right now there's an issue with trade because Canada exports canola to China. China's putting um, restrictions on it. Those farmers can switch to hemp and um, have profitable seasons because the hemp is valuable in the global marketplace. Okay, and, and last question. You said you use 100% of the product from, from root to tip? We don't have a root use yet. So that might not be the only, that might be the only part, but we know that ginseng farmers, I've heard, I haven't, um, I haven't investigated yet, but people who use ginseng can also use the roots. And I hear that it could be good in teas, very healthy for you, but again, we haven't investigated the root use yet. Okay, so it, you said that the hemp plant in Chernobyl, for example, took out the poisons mm -hmm. and the whatever else, the toxins. Does, does the hemp plant put anything back into the soil at the end of its growth cycle? Put anything back in? The, Nutrients. The parts, yeah, yeah. So the parts that are left, so typically right now I know some farmers, they leave parts of the crop on the field because they're not using it. Um, sometimes um, farmers, they use uh, combines that only take out part of the plant and then the rest of the dust falls back. So that would be putting the nitro nitrogen back into the ground, making the soil more healthier. The hemp, it also opens up the root beds and it stabilizes water, um, water flow. So it's also good for the environment that way. The other thing that I forgot to mention is an acre of hemp will be four times as efficient as an acre of trees in absorbing. So one acre of hemp, four acres of trees, four times as efficient at absorbing carbon dioxide. So it's actually better if we can get more farmers to grow hemp because it's one of the best carbon sinks that we have in this fight against climate change. Okay, so there's the possibility that farmers who have to leave a field fallow for a year could plant hemp on it and plow in the roots, for example, and restore everything that, mm -hmm. that, that was missing. So in the 1600s in the USA, it was mandatory that farmers grow hemp in their rotation a farmer that I know in Calgary, he just called me when I told him I was doing this presentation. He said um, to mention in Germany, they put that law back in today. Farmers have to grow hemp in their rotation because of the benefits that it has to the soil and the benefits it has to the environment. This is a great story all the way around. Thank you. No problem. Councillor Vicente. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Akeem, and Randy. Thank you so much for uh, giving us all an opportunity to see your vision for this product. And uh, I was going to just mention uh, the fact that hemp, uh, because of its qualities, is the one of the most efficient carbon sinks in the plant kingdom. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is uh, one of the reasons why it is such a good material um, to then use and sequester that carbon into a building material. Its strength, uh, its compatibility with lime and mortars um, has been actually quite well documented. And that's where the opportunity for this is. And I think it's remarkable that uh, a, such a natural product can really possess such high tech qualities. And uh, we, this council, we salute you for considering to bring your business idea here. Uh, I know that uh, the uh, Brampton Entrepreneur Center was very key in uh, helping you both mm -hmm. to establish your business. And uh, I want to commend staff for uh, helping young entrepreneurs in this city to uh, identify and realize their ideas mm -hmm. in, in uh, forgive the pun, more concrete fashion. Um, in, in terms of the... Um, energy storage capability that is like amazing mm -hmm. can you just explain 
how that works, I guess in layman's terms, how, how is it possible for him to act as a batter? There's a couple different ways of getting it, and forgive me, I'm not the most te technical. Just very top it, level. But top level, I know that hemp, we know that hemp is way more efficient, 200 times more efficient than graphene at storing energy, and it's also cheaper than graphene to store energy. And the, um, the hemp carbon or the hemp fibers in bricks, what it can do is it can store up to five volts of energy in little bricks like, um, like we see on our finishes of our, of our house right now. So what uh, one of our company's goals is to get this technology here because, again, this vision is too big for any one person to do, but I know that we have the ability, the expertise in Brampton to use the just biofiber block that's already building code compliant and then find ways to store energy in there safely so it could pass building code for the future of our, our cities or the future of our homes and our communities. Again, thank you very much for both of you presenting. Uh, we encourage you in any way that we can help. Thank you. Uh, I look forward to staff's report back thank on you. how they can work together with you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, team. Um, so it, it has been moved. I just want to say it was, a, it was a, an excellent presentation. I had an opportunity to speak with uh, uh, Akeem and uh, very informative and uh, a very uh, impressive presentation today. Thank you so much. Uh, so the, it has been referred back to staff by uh, Council Santos. All in favor? That carries. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to move on to the next uh, delegation, uh, which is... So we have a delegation from um, Dale Lang uh, on behalf of Bike, Bike Brampton uh, Volunteer Group uh, in the Bike Port um, in Kevin Montgomery regarding active transportation. Welcome. Thank you very much, um, Chair Singh and um, Mayor Dylan. Brown and Dylan. Sorry. Apologies. Chair Dillon, and um, members of council, and uh, staff, and um, the, the public. I um, am requesting a little bit more time. I need another couple of minutes. Okay, thank you. So, um, I, first of all, I want to, uh, to start by thanking Councillor Santos and Mayor Brown for championing these AT projects valued at $1.875 million. The big ass projects symbolize our six years of volunteer work to make Brampton become a bicycle friendly community, not only in name, but also in practice. This is about much more than bike lanes for people who cycle. This is about safe streets. Cycling creates safety in an inclusive, equitable community. It is transformative. These projects are in line with priorities of the pending Active Transportation Master Plan. We are mindful of the bike lane history in Brampton, uh, namely Rutherford Road and Fletcher's Creek Boulevard. We are asking for approval from Council to commence public engagement while staff prepares implementation details. Early and extensive outreach is the critical element for successful implementation. Furthermore, having shovel-ready phased infrastructure AT projects makes Brampton better positioned to leverage grants from other levels of government. Therefore, we feel that time is of the essence. In discussions with Councillor uh, Santos, City Active Transportation staff, Peel Public Health, and understanding the priorities in the pending ATMP, we define the following criteria on which to prioritize key projects. AT is a visible form of on-road expression of cycling, um, of active transportation, and we would like these projects to make that statement like this buffered bike lane in Toronto Simcoe Street. 
Bike lane priorities coordinate with um, the uh, pending ATMP concept of developing a walking and cycling culture. These projects must conform with Peel's Sustainable Transportation Strategy 2041 target of 50% peak period trips taken by sustainable transportation. Imagine our congestion when our population grows by 40%. These projects need to enhance Brampton's bicycle-friendly status, advancing us from bronze to silver. The project should span the city, connect the network, especially the first last mile pieces to transit and schools. The project should consider all road users with complete streets designs making the road safer and comfortable. Narrowing existing wide lanes will have the extra benefit of reducing speed and lowering collision rates, like this 32% documented on a lane in Ottawa. All three Toronto downtown BIAs supported making the bike lane pilot projects permanent because quite simply, it's good for business. We want our share of the annual $428 million cycle tourism business in Ontario. The projects will deliver health, social and economic benefits due to increasing physical activity. Sustainable transportation helps our city better adapt to climate change. Cycling improves spending options for the middle class. Equity is essential. So we developed three key projects that fit these criteria. The first, Fix-It Curb Cuts, is identified in the pending ATMP. High curbs are barriers to the accessibility of the network. Navigating a high curb with a bike trailer increases the cyclist's time on the roadway, which exposes them to much higher risk, and it can be as much as 50% longer to cross a street. People on wheelchairs simply can't access paths with high curbs. This particular installation in this image on Marybrook Trail at, um, at Sandalwood is excellent, but there's hundreds of others in the city of Brampton that need attention. Key projects two and three are the east-west and north-south bike, bike routes. Project two is the center town bikeway. This one route connects to many important destinations across the, the city, as you can see from this slide. Imagine 25 schools along one route. The full 31-kilometer east-west route will cost more than our budget, so we are recommending its completion in three phases. Starting with the center 8.2-kilometer section, the route starts at Beauvaird and Royal Orchard, travels south and along Vauden, um, east on Vauden, then Howden, Hanover to Chinkuzi Park at Central Park Drive. Less traveled roads like Vauden, shown here, were selected. Key project two is, or three, is the north-south bikeway, and of course this image is, is uh, obviously turned on its, on its side on purpose. This 11.4 route would complete a north-south connection in one phase. It would start at Russell Creek and Mayfield Drive in the north and travel south to the Bramley Go Transit Hub. Lower volume roads like Fern Forest, which is shown in this image, um, and McKay already have urban shoulders that can be converted into buffered bike lanes. This project also has an impressive list of destinations along its length. Our request is that Council support all of these priorities, not just one, but all of them. And we understand that staff agrees with this. For this year, however, we are recommending we start with phase one of the key project two, Centre Town Bike Way and then progress through the other projects and phases as budgets and grants permit.
simple, clear wayfinding signage for residents and tourists is essential to improve, um, to improve navigation and that whole concept of first mile, last mile access to transit. Year-round maintenance is necessary to reinforce the walking and cycling culture. And of course, I had to get in a, a photo of um, the Franciscini Bridge because, you know, it's gorgeous. Routes must be monitored with uh, eco um, counters to provide data to measure before and after success. The 27,000 crossings of the Franciscini Bridge since last June are a concrete example of why we need to track infrastructure use. The secret to Ottawa's gold bicycle friendly community status is always having 25 shovel ready projects in their back pocket. 25 at any given time on a rolling basis. So when funding is available and grants are announced, they're ready. We are asking council support for commencing early public engagement for comprehension, understanding, empathy, and acceptance. We need creativity since our traditional picks, unfortunately, have poor attendance. We're requesting that council direct staff to change their customary public engagement strategy for this project and start as soon as is realistically possible. Bike Brampton can assist council and staff to go to where people are, including town halls, bike month, community rides, bike to school week, bike to work day, and of course, bike the creek. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Langan. So uh, we do have a few speakers. Uh, Councillor Santos. Thank you, through you, Chair. Thank you, Dale, and our cycling community who are here today, also standing in solidarity for this presentation. Um, I just have to highlight that uh, over the past couple of months now, since we tabled that uh, funding support for active transportation, um, we've all taken a very collaborative approach. It's been the community together with the city staff from Public Works, as well as from Planning, um, City Council, and, and the Mayor. We've all been involved in helping to formulate what you're presenting today. Um, and so I'm super happy to refer this back to staff for a report um, in May. Uh, which I think is in the works already. Um, and it's actually, I think, coming forward during the first week of Bike Month, which starts the week of May 22nd? 7th. 7th. Yep, so I think the report is coming back, and we look forward to, to that report. Um, and uh, in terms of the communication piece, I really wanted to talk about that piece, because we spoke about it in the meetings leading up to this presentation today. The communication piece is important because, uh, and doing it early is important, because the culture of Brampton right now when it comes to commuting and travel is really focused on the car. And if we want to change that culture uh, to one that promotes active transportation and even transit, then, then we, that communication has to start early to start that culture shift. What I really like about the map and the plan and, and what we've mapped out here is that it includes east-west routes, it includes north-south um, in areas like wards 9 and 10 and 7, 8, which connects to the Bramley GO train station and through the downtown core and other routes as well. Um, and people, I think, are going to look at the map and say... Sorry, uh, Councillor Santos, yes. these are questions for the okay, sure. delegation. Okay, I do, I have a question. Don't worry, it's coming. This, is, this looks great, but when the time comes for implementation, everyone may get scared because it's in front of their front yard. So in terms of a communication strategy, if we were to do something early, what would something like that look like, number one? And number two, and this is a signal to staff as well, we could really take advantage by planning early and make Bike Month this year super big for the city of Brampton and, and use Bike Month as a culture shift and promote what this new plan is, is for the city. So just some ideas from you on what a communication plan might look like. Um, through you, Chair Dillon, 
Um, Councillor Santos is uh, making an excellent um, point about this, and communication has to be, again, as I was mentioning, where the people are. It could be a pop-up tent along the Etobicoke Creek Trail or along the Chinkuzi Trail. Actually, probably it should be along both. Um, where people are given information, it should be um, short, sweet, and catchy. Um, like the infographic that I put at the, um, at the bottom of the report that we tabled um, for um, today's delegation, that's an infographic that just uh, was published by um, Share the Road Cycling Coalition, something that has a lot of information on it but basically can go onto one poster. And they had that at the Ontario Bike Summit yesterday on an easel. So things like that that are informative and, and yet get the message across. And I also think um, that it's really important that this not just be about um, cars versus um, bikes because that is not what this story is about at all. This is about community building. This is about creating equity in our community. This is about giving people um, choices. This is about um, reducing our, our carbon footprint. It's about so much more than cars versus bikes. Um, it is truly um, a really important step for this, um, for this city. And that's, um, I feel, what our thrust for our communication strategy should be. Thank you. Um, so through your chair, I think also the one thing to add here is perhaps communication um, at GO Transit areas as well to encourage GO Transit users, GO Train users to also bike to the GO Train. Um, and I will add here in terms of curb cuts. What is that? If you could go into more detail, for, mm -hmm. because I know what it is as a cyclist, okay. I get it. But if you want to explain what that is to everyone, that would be great. Let me just zoom back to that slide quickly, and I can point it out very quickly. Okay, that is an example of a depressed curb that was built that way. You can see how it slopes down towards the roadway. Um, and at, on the far side of the street, again, so you, it allows you to cross the street at, at a level point. Um, and if we go back to the slide before, this is actually a walkway between two communities um, just east of Credit View Road. Um, and it's got a high curb. So basically, you come from the roadway, um, this raised curb is a barrier for you to get onto this pathway if you're either pulling, um, if you're on a bike that's pulling a trailer, or if you're in a wheelchair, this is basically not accessible for you at all. And if you're somebody, um, maybe a, a parent with one of those trailer bikes, to, to stop and try to get up onto this, you're in the roadway for, it can, it has been judged to be as much as 50% longer. So it's, it's actually, a, it's a safety issue as well as a barrier issue. We've got some great trails in Brampton already. I, I can even think of the Flower Town Trail, which probably many of you don't even necessarily even know about. It's a beautiful trail and it's completely stopped by all the north-south roads because of that barrier with high curbs. And if you're someone who is um, agile and very able to bump up on the curb, <laughs> Um, then, then this is not, it, bumping down is not a problem, but bumping up is something that is uh, skill required. Um, I haven't. I, I think I attempted it once, almost fell, and that was the end of it. So um, it is. It's a. It's a barrier to great paths that we've already got in this city. Wonderful, and I think the fact that we are going to be, you know, investing in the curb cuts is fantastic for existing cyclists. But for those who we are encouraging now to take their bikes, um, one other thing in this plan and proposal uh, is that it doesn't hide away, doesn't hide cyclists into the trails. Part of changing the culture around active transportation is actually seeing bikes sharing the road with cars. Um, and so we had this discussion when we were meeting with staff, everyone was in agreement and I'm really... Uh, Santos. Yeah. Um, sorry, uh, I think you're making excellent points, but I've just been reminded that uh, uh, we, we do have a long meeting and uh, uh, 
at 3, 3 p.m. I am just uh, super there's... passionate about no, this. I know, I know, okay. I know. <laughs> really good points too, but uh, um, perhaps if you have a question. One final question. Yeah. So for why is that north-south route to the Bramley Transit Terminal along uh, Fern Forest so important? Now this is a community that isn't necessarily used to seeing bike paths. So if you can share why it's so important to have, especially 9, 10, 7, 8, that trail. Through you, um, Chair Dillon, we, we looked at several of the north-south routes and we do have some, we have the Etobicoke Creek Trail, we've got the Chinkuzi Trail, um, and the Etobicoke trail, trail does go all the way from the south to the north end of Brampton, 26 kilometers. However, there isn't an, um, a really good safe option on the, um, the east side of the, the city. And um, we looked at the Fern Forest and McKay option because, um, well, that whole, that whole north to south route, 60% of that is on road, well, and um, it's actually, yeah, um, about 60-40 split, and 40% is on trail, uh, the Chinkusian and Esker Lake trails. Um, the reason Fern Forest and McKay are excellent choices for this is that, is that they already have the, um, the shared um, cur urban shoulder, thank you. They already have the urban shoulder <laughs> that is ready to be converted into a bike lane. And so this is, this is um, really an ideal route. And um, we want to get more people to use this first mile, last mile. And so having something that connects to the Bramley GO station then in a direct north-south route, and this is, like you saw from the map, it is almost directly north-south, is, is going to be um, an excellent um, opportunity to encourage more people to cycle. There is apparently some research, which I have not been able to lay my hands on just yet, um, done by Metrolinx that shows that there's a fair um, amount of um, potential, potential cycling ridership in the general vicinity that's from, um, uh, from the Bramley Go station too. <laughs> we can we can carry on. We can carry on. Yeah, I I think I answered the okay. question. Yeah. All right. So, Councillor um, Santos, um, thank you for your uh, your questions. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Councillor Maderos next. He was on on the board. He got off. Now he's back on. By laps. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, through the chair. Um, thank you for the delegation. Um, I heard when you talked about all the virtues of the communication plan, what you'd like to promote. The one thing I didn't hear, and if you can speak to its importance, because that seems to be sometimes an issue, especially in our downtown, economic development. How having the connectivity on having uh, uh, active transportation actually is good for business. If you can speak a little bit about that. Okay. Um, through you, Chair Dillon. Um, in, um, in the 50-page report that I um, um, included as part of our delegation. Um, there, it, it's fleshed out um, in much more detail about the economic advantages of, um, of, of having cycling infrastructure. And this has been well documented um, across North America in quite a few communities um, about just even how much the, uh, re the sales, because people who, go, who travel places by bike um, they, um, they spend more on, on average, um, they stop more off uh, more frequently in retail establishments, and um, it's generally been overall good for business. Um, and that's the reason that those um, three downtown BIA um, uh, groups in uh, Toronto um, approved um, or endor um, supported a council, the City of uh, Toronto Councils, um, making those bike lanes in downtown Toronto permanent. Um, Simcoe, uh, Richmond, uh, Peter, Adelaide, I think those are the four, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and there's, there's a, a real advantage in terms of the economic advantage of people um, who arrive by bicycle are energized, I certainly felt that by coming here this morning by bike, <laughs> um, that 
you're ready to um, to do to do your work, and there is um, documented evidence that it actually improves productivity. So it's productivity for the people arriving by by bike. It's productivity for um, the um, for the the people then that are working in um, in businesses, and it's been shown to actually improve the um, the retail value along corridors where there is bike infrastructure. Of course, the um, the interesting thing is the more infrastructure you put in, the more this, this levels off the, the playing field for, for everything. In terms of the advantage for this east-west corridor for the Brampton downtown, um, there are very um, many easy little pathways from Vauden um, down into the downtown Brampton. So this connects. Um, this connects City Hall, the Farmer's Market, the Rose Theatre, the Downtown Library, all the businesses um, in, in our downtown BIA. Um, it connects er everything and it makes it, um, it makes it much more vibrant and much easier for people to, uh, to get around. Uh, and thank you through the chair, uh, thank you for this. Um, what has, uh, in terms of uh, partnerships, with our current downtown BIA. I know there were some talks, some conversations, um, but do you not think there might be some potential there uh, for further collaboration? Uh, and um, yes. I'll let you. <laughs> yeah, um, through you, Chair Dillon. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, Mike Brampton is very willing to, uh, to work with the downtown BIA on this to help promote. Yeah, and, and through the chair, um, just to go off, uh, I guess, another uh, segue, um, at the Seniors Council, I'm a member of the Seniors Council, and I was approached by several seniors, uh, South Asian seniors, um, who presented me with a little bike, a little bike booklet, which had, I guess, the, the rules and regulations of, mm -hmm. of cycling. And, um, and one thing that struck me uh, was the fact that on, and when I go with my, with my son, and, and we uh, have, uh, over the last couple of years, increased our uh, our cycling is in terms of the routes, where to go, how to go, when to go on the road, when not go. It, it, it is becomes a little bit of a challenge, and um, and the connectivity is so important. But I just think that people still don't know where because it and basically um, what I'm trying to say is how important it is for to get some of these kids at schools and to get training. So people can feel comfortable to go from point A to point B. Um, because what I found myself was just going along the roads and, and I'd reach a dead, you know, I, I can't continue there, so we'd have to go some other route. And it was interesting, these seniors talked about that if we had more translated documents, which specified exactly where the routes were, where it was safe for them, that you'd get more people on the bike. So they asked me to uh, be able to provide that. So, any comments on that? To you, Chair yeah. Dillon, um, you've asked quite a few uh, really yeah. excellent <laughs> questions there. Uh, yeah. To start with, that was probably the, the Peel um, handbook that you were given. Yes. It yeah. is an excellent document, and Bike Brampton did have input into that document. Um, second of all, the City of Brampton um, has um, just, um, as of last year, come out with a brand new route map. We've updated our old route map, and that is an excellent document. We have um, we have um, uh, paper copies that are slightly water, you know, repellent, um, that are available uh, probably even down in the the foyer of City Hall. Um, Bike Brampton carries a great number of these, and they're they're given out. That is our single most important um, uh, handout. That we're even when we were at CD Saturday, everybody was asking for it. Um, every event we go to, people want those route maps, and they have been updated, and they have a lot of really good um, areas in them. Um, the other point you made was about the translation. Um, absolutely, um, as, as budget permits, if these documents can be translated, that's excellent. Um, the other point about in getting uh, people accustomed to to riding um, in different areas of the city. I'll alert you to th um, the Brampton community rides that are put on by the Cycling Advisory Committee, and I suspect that that, that will continue to, 
to, uh, to, uh, to go on as that committee is selected for this, this current term of council now. But there are the first 10 rides in the Brampton community rides are wards 1 through 10 in the city of Brampton. And so um, councillors are encouraged to come out to all of those, and I know some of you have participated in the past, and we would welcome everyone to come out. Bike Brampton members um, assist BSAC in the running of these rides. They're free rides. There is a, um, a, you know, a little treat like an ice cream or something at the end. They're five and 15 kilometers. Um, no one's left behind. And they're so that you can explore and get used to where the, 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 the safe on-road uh, routes are and you're traveling in a group. And so that's to, to make feel, people feel more comfortable. The final four rides are um, longer. There's, um, well, we, we are offering a, a five kilometer too, but they're typically the 15. And so we've got one that goes from one, um, from downtown up to Mount Pleasant Go, another one that goes from downtown down to Bramley Go, over to Bramley Go, and uh, one that goes up into uh, to Caledon. And so the whole idea is to get people accustomed to that. Um, we also um, um, like to exhibit with Bike Brampton at um, things like the Bram, um, Bramley Cycle Fest. That's another opportunity for people to get to, and, um, and Bike Brampton does the route planning for, for that. Um, Stella Brampton Bike Fest, um, we always have a booth, we can talk. We can also encourage people to come out to the Brampton Bike Hub, which is located at 50 Sunny Meadow Boulevard, just north of the uh, hospital. And there's a really good community where we have the um, mentors that help people. Are, people are joining the PedalWise program. They're, they're paired with a mentor. And um, then they can, um, they can become accustomed to, to riding in, in the area where they normally uh, travel, maybe go to business. Uh, shop, go to the doctor, whatever it is that they want to do. And we have a bike works program there where people learn basic, basic bike mechanic skills. And the whole thing is done in a really lovely community atmosphere where people just have a lot of fun and, um, and get to know each other a little bit better. So it's good for newcomers. We have seniors, we have young people come to that. And um, so these are all areas uh, where we feel that the promotion is, is really important. And, um, and hopefully this would answer um, some, of, some of your questions, Councillor Medeiros. Yeah, and, and through the turn, just uh, again, and, and thank you very much, and sorry to take up so much time. I guess my last question to go off on another direction. As we're building uh, this network and we're putting more resources towards it, at the same time, uh, this council is committed and as outlined in Vision uh, 2040 uh, to have more density, build more complete communities. One of the challenges, which um, having been a former member on the committee, uh, is the lack of infrastructure for cycling, cycling infrastructure. So for example, condominium buildings, to have places where um, it would have the infrastructure there lockers, etc., or places of business. And where I'm going with this, and I'd like to hear your opinion, um, as we, from a planning perspective, if there's a way that we can put out some carrots to when they're building, the developers are building these high rises, that if they included cycling infrastructure, that there would be some form of nugget do you, would, would you think that, because I'm just thinking, if we're putting our resources here, we're wanting the density, you know, the density, we want to also promote and have that infrastructure there that would allow it to be successful so people are actually using the trails and so on. So uh, what's your opinion on that? To you, Chair Dillon, um, this is a very important question you're raising, uh, Councillor Medeiros. Um, Cycling, um, good, safe, secure bicycle storage is very, very important to getting people um, to, to use their bike. Um, and we need good, lockable um, bike 
uh, parking all over the city, and I know it is something that um, that is um, included in the in the pending ATMP. The whole concept of good bike parking everywhere. In terms of actually building um, places like condominiums and actually all other buildings too, um, that could be something that um, that this council could consider as. Um, um, as a requirement to, for a building permit. Some other jurisdictions do this already. Um, I'm thinking Kitchener, Kitchener, let me help you guys. I, I'm, I'm sure that somewhere along the line I've heard that there are other jurisdictions that have actually put it into the building permit process yeah. that, that you must have so many yeah. so many spaces for uh, for bike parking and secure um, storage is really important because no one wants to have their bike stolen nobody does doesn't matter whether you know it's it's a forty dollar deposit that you put on on your bike from the lending library at the Brampton bike hub or a fifteen thousand dollar bike or anything in between nobody wants their bike stolen okay and I guess through the chair so that's something that um, if this council made a decision that area that's something that like Brampton would be very supportive of yes, yes. Great. yes. thank you so much okay. thank you councillor uh, Medeiros councillor um, Williams thank you through you chair um, thank you Councillor Medeiros because I was going to ask about security and parking because I know um, we're, you've done a great job of, of identifying some of the barriers um, to you know our communities and our residents really getting active into cycling but I was wondering how Brampton fared with security and parking so mm -hmm. <laughs> okay through, through you chair Dylan um, we've got some areas that are are really good and other areas that are quite frankly awful you know so and we've got everything in between and obviously um, when uh, when the city builds um, a, a lead gold building um, you can be sure that there's great bike parking there like the the new Peel Memorial Hospital um, there's there's good bar, um, bike parking under um, the Rose Theatre but there's a, a sign unless it's been removed recently there's a sign telling you um, no bikes allowed down below but the reason that sign was put up we understand is because they didn't want kids going down there and using the the parking lot as a race course but there's good bike parking down there and so once you start to cycle you start to know where there is good parking and where there isn't and it's not very pleasant and you don't feel very welcome as a customer when you have to um, you have to lock your bike up to a tree or um, some other kind of post or some kind of whatever you can find out there it does not feel like you're welcome I can tell you that all the cyclists at Bike Brampton and probably all the cyclists that is a real indication that you are welcome in your city when there's good bike parking mm -hmm. absolutely okay that's good to know um, so thank you through you chair um, you know, Ed, Councillor Santos mentioned and spoke very well about changing the culture in Brampton. And uh, one thing, you know, as a parent, my kids usually influence some of the decisions that I make because based on what they want to do. And um, so I'm wondering about the connection with the school system and the educational piece. Uh, I think there's about 140 to 150 schools already registered for the walk and roll. Um, so. What kind of connections have you made with the schools to help educate young people to influence parents to get more active on their bikes? Okay, through you, Chair Dillon, there's um, actually a couple of important things that I can, I can report on. First of all, we do have appeal safe and active routes um, to school uh, committee, starts, yeah. and, um, and, um, and David Lang, the chair of Bike Brampton, is the co-chair of, of that committee. And, um, and Polly sits on the committee as well. And, um, and that committee is, um, is meant to work with the school boards, Peel Public Health, um, Peel Active Transportation, um, Brampton Active Transportation, Mississauga, Caledon, and the whole idea is to come together to try to get more children to um, walk and bike to school. Um, it's well documented. This is actually starting to take off after years of not really pretty, very good engagement. It is starting to 
um, definitely improve. We've got some trustees like Trustee Kathy McDonald that is is really excellent, um, and I understand that um, the new trustee, I'm not sure whose name it is, um, from the Dufferin Peel Catholic Board is also very supportive. So there is hope that this continues. Um, to, that we need to make progress. Um, the Region Appeal, um, Active Transportation staff in their walk and roll appeal have been sing singularly in, um, impressive with the way that they've increased the numbers of participants and the schools participating in Bike to School Week year over year. And last year it was 160, and the goal for this year is 180, 175. 180, I think. I think we just heard this at the, the bike summit yesterday. Nice. It's 180. And, um, and it's, it's really growing in leaps and bounds. And the research also shows that the, um, the more that people participate in Bike to School Week, the more likely that it is to carry out to the other times of the year as well. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Councillor Williams. Mayor Brown. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, Back here. New technology at City Hall. Let's try again. Okay. Um, thank you for the presentation. I think we've had uh, an exhaustive list of uh, questions, but I think it speaks to the fact there's a lot of uh, interest and energy behind active transportation around this uh, council uh, table. So two questions just wanted to um, follow up on. Do you believe that the funding we've set aside um, is adequate for the big picture we're talking about in terms of signage uh, and in terms of having uh, the, the, the painted pathways that do you, you showed a, uh, a photo of? Because I think when it comes to broad public participation, you need to make it simple. Uh, and that signage and those, and those sort of dedicated um, paths uh, apart from vehicular traffic is, is so important to get that broad participation. When you're looking at what we've allocated um, as a significant first step towards active transportation, um, I assume you feel we're going the right direction, but do you think it's adequate um, for, what, for where we want to get? Um, through you, Chair Dillon, um, we were given 1.875 million for this as as part of this this special um, special big ask, and um, and this and in consultation with city staff, we feel that for the phase one of key project number two, um, this is actually this number should be okay in order to do what we need to do for <coughs> phase one. Um, certainly, in terms of um, of uh, the overall picture, um, I um, haven't had an opportunity to look at all the budget, um, the budget numbers for AT, and I know that we've still got the um, the AT, um, the active transportation master plan coming, and um, it is my hope that there's a, a good amount of money going into that because any um, any master plan is not worth the paper that it's, it's printed on unless there is a, an appropriate budget to go with it. And um, it is my hope that, that this is um, a, a substantial budget and that it, it is a budget that I hope that we can also increase moving forward. It, these are things that ultimately, I believe, are actually going to save the, the city money because we will not have the need to, um, to be paving more and more l lanes of road as we increase our, our mode share. Well, and so, and, um, and we... Prob probably the biggest savings that will be for the province when it comes to health care costs, with you look at the rate of diabetes. Yes. My last question is just on the downtown. I, I think this was referenced. How important do you believe for that big goal for our city on active transportation, how important it is that we have active transportation um, in the downtown? Through you, Chair Dillon, I believe that's very important. That's vital. It's it's vital a vital part of the community building and the revitalization of downtown to um, to have active transportation be part of that. Okay. Absolutely, okay. it's vital. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Brown, Councillor Fortini, our final speaker. Yes, uh, thank you through the chair, and thank you for all you do. I know you have a great passion, and your team over there, Kevin and all, everyone. 
Uh, just have one question because we're getting uh, getting some signals here. It's been too long. On the main roads, I find that me and my wife, a lot of times, we take our bike, we go up to Professor's Lake or go around Chikosi Park. When you're on the main roads, to get the people moving more, do you find it would be better if we have all that grain field and we that do an asphalt instead of being on the main road and people could travel back and forth from that portion? Through you, Chair Dillon, um, that's an excellent question, um, Councillor Fortini. Um, you will, you will find that the people who are um, able to cycle very quickly and who have been cycling their whole life and are really good at it, they will cycle anywhere. Right. They will cycle. They'll cycle up Highway 10. They don't care. They'll cycle anywhere. You'll find that there are people who will only ever cycle on um, a multi-use path, like Etobicoke Creek Trail. They will never go onto a road. You will find that there's people like me who will cycle on both, depending on the, the occasion. Like, like this morning, I came down mostly by road because the path, understandably, has not been swept yet of the winter debris, and it's too gritty. And so I won't cycle on the path when it's full of, of grit with my road bike. Um, you'll, you'll, it's really important for commuters that you offer both on-road facilities, which incidentally are less expensive, to, to paint some um, buffered bike lanes onto the road. It's less money than having a whole separate multi-use path at the side. On the regional roads, because of the high volume, uh, Peel Region is, is starting to put more and more of these multi-use paths in. And that's definitely something that is, um, that is an important part in the whole mixture of being able to have good infrastructure. But you'll find that some people will never cycle on a multi-use path. They definitely need to be maintained as well as the road. In the winter time, you basically only can cycle on on the roads if if the trails are, are and the you know the snow melts and the ice builds up, and so you have to go on the road. So it's always going to to be a mixture, and that's why we can't just say that cycling is a recreational activity that is uh, relegated to families uh, with small children on a Sunday afternoon. No, it's got to be for everyone. It's got to be all inclusive. And, and we need a variety of infrastructures to make it inclusive. Thank you. But uh, you get someone like myself, I've always rode a bike as a child. I, you know, so I, I'm OK to drive the bike on the road and all. But someone like my wife, when she sees a, a road that's more traffic, she doesn't want to go on it. So I see the regional roads and main roads. We already have a piece of asphalt to put the snow to make it eight feet, and we can get both use of it for people to get the moving. Mostly it's good exercise and getting them on the main roads if he has to cross. She will never go on the main road because she's too scared. So, you know, I always thought that we got all this grass for cutting, and we got asphalt. I don't understand why we're going to do eight feet and have, like, I see it on Lakeshore. They have it. They got it on the paths. They have the, the drawings on the, on the floor with a line. And people are using it, and uh, it gives you more, people more active. Yeah, so, um, so. Through you, Chair Dillon, um, it is it's Im it's important that um, that there be separated infrastructure. People will always feel safer if there's separated infrastructure. The first choice is on road. Um, if if um, you've got someone in your family who's not comfortable riding on the road, then I do encourage um, you to actually come out for some of our community yeah. bike rides. Because honestly, I was uncomfortable to start with too, and it's only through practice and getting accustomed to checking your shoulder and doing all those great things that you do develop that level of comfort. No, and I agree. And I know Toronto, they changed all the catch bases because, you know, the catch bases were all, so the tires won't catch. Now they make them on an angle. And I know Stephen Brampton's been changing them. So yeah. good luck. And I'll be there one of these days. But thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fortini. And uh, we do appreciate uh, you coming in and delegating today. We had a very uh, 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 good conversation, great discussion. And uh, uh, I do believe um, Councillor Santos has moved uh, a referral back to staff. Can you hear me? Through you, Mr. Chair, it's a refer motion is to refer back to staff for consideration in the report that's coming back in May on this matter. Right. So, uh, all in favor of that? That carries. And I would just like to uh, remind um, 
Council that we have uh, that beyond six delegations we do have publicized. Uh, we also have three more uh, delegations included, which are uh, 5.7 delegation from uh, Rick Wesselman uh, regarding uh, tax fairness of Rosedale. We also have 5.8 delegations from uh, delegations regarding uh, here Ontario, Maine, LRT. There's uh, four delegations, and we also have 5.9. Um, just correspondence uh, from, uh, sorry, we have delegation from Sylvia Roberts uh, regarding 9.2.1. So uh, we do have a very uh, busy uh, agenda today. And so uh, we're going to move on to the next item, which is. Where are we on now? 5.4. Uh, Kevin Montgomery from uh, Bikeport. Kevin, can you get it done in five minutes? Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a, there should be a presentation to go with this? Through you, Mr. Chair, we're pulling up the presentation. There seem to be uh, gremlins in the system because the <laughs> computer has frozen. But uh, if you can proceed, we'll bring it up as soon as possible. Um, okay, I'll do the best I can then. Um, the presentation uh, models a concept that, um, I, per the name of the presentation, uh, looks at the value of a dollar as it pertains to um, when taxes are collected from the residents of the city. Um, they're held and then spent. And so it, what the presentation um, looks at is um, how well is value retained or lost when it's spent on a kilometer of um, enabling cycling versus enabling more driving in the city of Brampton. Um, the slide deck has some, pardon me. Oh, perfect, okay, here we go. Um, right, so it's inspired, I, I don't know how helpful this is. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's inspired by a document that was released in the city of Copenhagen. Um, and what it does is, is, beyond the cost of just construction, it looks at additional costs using criteria like, here we go, um, here we go. So they look at additional things, thank you very much, of uh, vehicle operating costs, uh, additional time costs, accident costs, uh, pollution and externalities, as well as recreational value and safety. Um, I wouldn't look at the numbers too strictly because this is kind of a conversion from a few years ago, so obviously currency values have changed and such, but what you can see is that there's basically a five times higher cost when you enable more driving than cycling. So when we look at how a model might, like this might apply um, in the city of Brampton, um, we start with vehicle costs. Um, this is modeled after um, uh, the CAA vehicle cost calculator, if anyone is familiar with that. Um, basically what you can see here, it, it, what this slide contemplates is that um, once you've built the infrastructure, people have to spend money to use it. So how much money are they going to spend on a car versus uh, a bicycle in, in order to enable use of that infrastructure? So that's an internalized cost that this uh, slide deck contemplates. Uh, the next one is just increased vehicle operating costs. And this is just comes with like stop and go behavior of traffic and how does that wear and tear affect a car? So there's additional costs um, to drivers uh, for that as well. Uh, congestion speed ratios. This is based off of a model in uh, the region of Peel's um, long-range transportation plan. Um, and what this looks at is kind of like expected uh, speeds of an average trip versus what you actually get uh, during rush hour at peak time. Uh, so what you can see is that you, you lose a lot of your expected speed driving than you would um, uh, using a bicycle. So the, the consistency of bicycle speeds is better and therefore um, the value is better there. Accidents, there's a higher rate of accidents, of course. Uh, I think this was discussed uh, as well in a, in a previous presentation um, in Ottawa, perhaps, where there was a benefit of less accidents when you've invested uh, in cycling infrastructure. This relates to that. Um, this kind of puts a cost on the higher risk uh, of accidents when driving. Uh, and of course, health, obesity and heart disease risk. So in this case, there's a clear appreciation uh, in the dollar spent. Uh, on cycling infrastructure, you get direct health benefits after that uh, versus uh, increased risk to health when you enable people to drive more. Uh, finally, a, a premature death mortality benefit. So what, what this says is that 
Um, generally, people who are more active and cycle more tend to live longer, and so there's a, there's a cost benefit to that too. Vehicle emissions, this uh, has to do obviously with, uh, con um, it kind of relates very closely to climate change that we saw a, present, uh, a presentation on earlier. Uh, this puts a cost on the externality costs of emissions from cars uh, contributed by drivers and what the public has to pay for to, to mitigate that. So when we kind of bring this model together, uh, bring all the costs together, this is you know a, a hypothesis, I guess, of, of, of what we're ultimately left with, where um, when you spend a dollar on a kilometer to, to invest in, in, in enabling more cycling, you see that the value of that dollar is, has a better retention than if it's spent on enabling people to drive. In fact, what this model could very well indicate is that when you enable people to drive, when that money is spent on driving, you're going to have to seek additional revenue, either out of pocket directly from drivers or uh, through additional taxes to mitigate uh, health effects, uh, emissions effects, and things like that. Um, and so it, there's a significant value lost there when we enable people to drive. Uh, so ultimately, my ask of uh, committee, of council, is don't just settle for this hypothesis. Like, let's get the data. A lot of this was modeled off of reports, uh, derived from reports from the region appeal, CAA, that kind of thing. But we don't really have, um, that, I'm, that I've been able to find, our own direct data that supports a model like this. So, so let's try to get it. Um, there's criteria listed there. Uh, I won't repeat it all for, for the sake of saving time. Uh, but it's basically, it's based on the report uh, from Copenhagen, uh, very similar to that. Uh, and then ultimately, whatever data is accumulated, let's make it open and public. Let's put it on the uh, City of Brampton GeoHub open data catalog so that everyone is, is aware of these uh, benefits of, of how their taxes are being spent uh, and the value to themselves ultimately in, in using the cycling infrastructure. Councillor Dillon will be right back. I'm just <laughs> filling in for him. Uh, we have Councillor Santos. Thank you. So this won't be long. Thank you, Kevin, for the through you acting chair uh, to Kevin. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I think I, I'd like to move to receive the report and uh, just keep in mind that these are some of the stats and figures that we should be using to convince people to take active transportation instead of using the car. It's part of that culture shift. So the more we use this these facts and figures, especially the dollar amounts, um, the better in terms of our communication strategy for active transportation. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you very much. Seeing no other questions, Kevin, you did it in five minutes. Um, may I have a motion to receive the, we've already got it from Councillor Santos, all in favor? That carries, thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Dillon. Mr. Chair, we're back to the platform. Thank you, Councillor Bowman. And we're going to move on to 5.5, a delegation from Susan Godfrey, Susie Godfrey, uh, from the down, downtown Brampton BIA. Chair Dillon and uh, council members, it's Susie Godfrey from the downtown Brampton BIA, and I'm here with our vice chair, Christina Romasco. And we're here for um, uh, just to, to, to update council on our in kind service request for 2019. And just to give everybody a little bit of history, every year we do this ask. Uh, we did do a, pre a budget presentation back on March the 20th, and um, we had sent a letter following our budget presentation, we had sent a letter to city staff with regards to the 2019 in-kind service request ask, and it directly relates to the downtown Brampton BIA's events coming up for 2019. And um, just on this slide here, I'm not going to go into all the fine details, but we are seeking support from city council and staff with regards to the upcoming Easter egg hunt, the downtown Brampton's farmers market, and our summer events, uh, Party in the Lanes on July 19 and August the 23rd, as well as the trick-or-treating event in downtown Brampton. And I did want to preface the farmer's market in particular. Um, most of these requests re relate to, uh, sorry. sorry, okay. Most of these requests relate to the usage of public spaces such as Daily, Daily Times Square or Vivian Lane 
to event support at Party in the Lanes, whether it's staging, tables, tents, and equipment. And again, with trick-or-treating, it's a, you know, relating to the venue itself. So the, the summary here, um, the in-kind service request support is approximately valued at 13700 In the letter that I had sent back in March to city staff, the, the amount was higher. So your letter in the council package is incorrect. The values are incorrect. And I believe these numbers, I know they have to go back to city staff again to be verified, but I believe it's actually a little bit lower than the number here, 13,700. And just from uh, historical data here, last year the in-kind support request was approximately 28,000. The second part of my presentation today is with regards to our budget presentation on March the 20th, and specifically Councillor Medeiros and Councillor Santos had asked the BIA and myself to come back to Council with additional information on how the city could assist the downtown core. So I'm not going to read verbatim this whole slide, but I did want to highlight that we would like to see the city prioritize the lighting in the downtown core and specifically the laneways. So we are working with city staff on a project called Light Up Our Laneways and we do know that two public laneways are currently being looked at um, as far as enhancing the lighting with a, a Edison lighting treatment, but we would like to see additional laneways in the downtown downtown core be prioritized and we'd also like to make note that there was um, provincial funding and there still is from the Main Street Revitalization Fund from the province and the city of Brampton was allocated approximately $500,000 so uh, our board and, and staff would like to see city look at prioritizing lighting because um, pretty lighting makes your downtowns look more inviting more more um, more you know there's more energy when you see lights and most importantly, it, uh, you know, the perception for safety. And we know that there are some issues in that area, so we would like to take note of that. Uh, the second part is to specifically look at Diplock Lane, where Nelson Parking Garage is, because, again, it's very dark behind there, and we do have a lot of business owners, landlords, local residents and staff, employees of the downtown core, uh, echoing various concerns with regards to that area. So again, it's not a simple fix, like let's just put up a floodlight. We need a, a serious lighting expert to come in and, and an, possibly a landscape architect and to look at that whole area and connect the dots from the walkways and the lights um, to, you know, as you're parking your car in that garage, how do you get onto Main Street? How do you get onto Queen Street? And some, some possibly some new signage as well. So we'd like to, uh, to highlight that in particular. Um, we have also um, created a laneway task force at our um, office with various board members because of additional issues beyond the lighting. So we did hear over the winter months uh, lots of concerns with regards to the service levels, uh, with regards to snow removal, ice, litter, needles i don't i'm not going to go into all the details but we are looking um as board members and staff uh we're going to be analyzing each laneway and we're going to be providing some in information back to the city on this uh, to advocate some of the concerns we'd like you know some, some to find some solutions for better maintenance of these areas and um, a, a big part of the laneway issues goes back to private and public properties and easements and various legal agreements or, you know, it could take, we don't want to see something like fixing a light take six months or a year. Um, something simple like that should, uh, and, it, and it's no, I'm not pointing the finger at anyone, we just need to review that whole area and, and find um, some solutions so that when there are problems that they can be fixed quicker. Um, another part of today's presentation is, um, the downtown Brampton banner arms, so there's approximately 50 banner arms in the downtown core. We hold our two for each banner arm, um, sorry, for each lamppost, we hold two banners, and they're very old, and so, uh, again, it's some something that could be looked at as, you know, some new infrastructure, and we'd like to request uh, that city look at, at at that cost. I'd be happy to help you with providing some costs on that with various suppliers. Uh, we just came back from the Ontario BIA conference last night with with the 
over 200 downtowns across Ontario. There's lots of great programs out there with regards to signage and banners and um, with, uh, we know that the current banner arms are in disrepair and you're seeing a lot of rippage in the banners and you know again going back to first impressions of a downtown core those banners are pretty when they're not ripped but you know, with high winds and everything so uh, double banner arms would probably be a good solution for that. Uh, we'd also like to talk about city, the city department's coordinating who's hanging what, whether it's a banner or a flower hanging flower basket, because we have had some hurdles in the past, so that's more of a simple fix. And back in the fall, when we were putting together our 2019 budget, we were under the impression we were going to be under construction right now, so our, our board and uh, did not budget for the holiday basket. So it has been a, you know, there have been some informal conversations about possibly maybe that's something the city could help us with, with regards to this coming holiday season. Um, the next part of my presentation is to talk about uh, possibly designating the downtown core as a special service area. We have seen this done in other downtowns in United States in particular. So, so what this means is that beyond just a designation of a downtown Brampton business improvement area with a special levy, it's also a special service area. So when there's a, a snowstorm or high winds or whatever that is, the downtown has is a priority in the service levels of all the different contractors that you're working with um, because we do see sometimes that um, we, we might get a you know the snow removal started but the, you know the, the sidewalks have not been properly properly cleared and the snow banks are still high and then pedestrians have issues with the walkability of our downtown and um, other issues we hear often are just general litter issues not waste management litter on an everyday basis, so possibly having some additional staff to help make our downtown cleaner on a 24-7 basis. Um, and, and other issues, uh, thankfully we don't have too much of it, but we do have sometimes problems with gra graffiti. And um, with regards to the downtown Brampton BIA budget, we did have some comments from some of you with regards to the budget being very small or low and lean. And um, every year, the, the city of Brampton, through the Economic Development Department, gives the BIA a $40,000 grant. So today, I'm asking if, if council would consider uh, helping the BI out with regards to increasing the size of that grant, whether that's additional cash or prop leveraging other programs already in place and possibly partnerships with economic development to build on the destination development of the downtown core. And um, I have had some meetings with the city staff and have another meeting tomorrow on this matter, but I did did want to want to make note that um, there is a lot of exciting opportunities for our downtown core in tourism and first impressions, but we've got to be really honest about it. Like when you get off the GO train in downtown Brampton, what's your first impression? So we have um, a lot of great ideas that we want to share with city staff and council on how we can make our downtown dynamic, vibrant, and safe, and something to be proud of. And there's lots of quick fixes and quick wins here. I've, I've read lots of tourism reports in my career, and I will highlight there is one tourism consultant that actually just did some work for downtown Orangeville. His name is Roger Brooks, and he he's a, an expert in destination development. And the number one, I'm just going to quote a report on that he did for, I believe it was Nova Scotia, where they have a first impressions program where they, uh, similar to the granting program that's in place for the city, but it's specifically focused on the downtown. So if you want to fund a jazz festival or um, you want to do a busker festival in the downtown core, it's analyzed on how the effect of that event um, prioritizes the businesses in the downtown and making those, you know, helping those businesses in a sense of let's build that economic value, let's build the gross downtown product in downtown Brampton. But I will quote him, the number one activity of visitors in the world is shopping, dining, and entertainment in a pedestrian-friendly, intimate setting. Your downtowns 
So we have a lot of great opportunities in this downtown, and I just, I'm just i really excited. We just came back from the conference. Christina and I have uh, lots of great ideas, but we do have a lean machine at the office. We have two full-time staff and one part-time staff and a number of very engaged board members and volunteers. So um, I'm looking forward to furthering that discussion on how we can build the tourism of the downtown core and of course our you know better our business activity and the next part of my my presentation is we had some top are you, is timing okay uh if you can just try to wrap it okay, up i'll wrap it up okay so another uh program to consider is looking at a patio pilot program for 2020 we're not asking for this for this year but we have seen other downtowns implement a pilot project for patios and again it goes back to economic development and how we can help our, our restaurateurs and lastly i'd just like to to ask council to continue to prioritize the number of projects that are already in the works for the downtown, including the Ryerson University, the streetscaping upgrades in the downtown core, the Queen Street Master Plan, Riverwalk, all day two-way go, and, and new residential growth in the downtown through the new condo developments. So in closing, a, a vibrant and dynamic downtown is essential to the overall success and health of every major city. A downtown core is not just about shopping, it's a community destination. And really, I've heard consultants call downtowns are a community service for the whole city. And I'm really excited to be here today with Christina, and we're looking forward to working with council on how we can continue to build our downtown. Thank you very much. Uh, we have Councillor Santos. Thank you. Uh, through you, Chair, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, uh, and I'm happy to refer this back to staff for a report back on some of the new things you have here. Um, these requests are based on some conversations that we've had with Councilor Majeros and myself at BIA board meetings. Yes. Um, so happy to refer it back to staff uh, for a report back. Um, just a quick question, because it wasn't clearly outlined here. Um, the, the decision on the pause for downtown reimagine. Um, I know that the small businesses in the downtown core um, have been uh, impacted by that a bit. If you can share some of the those concerns and perhaps why you're now asking for a few more things to help uh, the situation in downtown, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. So there's been a number of different opinions on the decision that council made back in December. And um, some of those uh, uh, you know, responses have been of disappointment, I'll be completely honest. And others have been relieved because of, you know, there's a lot of fear in small business uh, when you're going to be redeveloping a downtown core. There is tremendous fear with, with certain businesses that are relying strictly on uh, foot traffic in the downtown when a downtown is, is closed down. Uh, we're, we're coming back today because we know we need to build this downtown and our $500,000 budget is great, but collaboration with the city and other business partners in the community is only going to make this downtown better. And from a, a bigger picture of tourism for the whole city, if you have a vibrant, dynamic downtown, you'll have a trickle effect and, and new economic activity in other uh, business sectors of, of, of Brampton. Thank you, Councillor Plushy. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Acting Chair. Thanks, Susie, for coming. Um, I often say, Susie, that I, I, I want to see you more often um, come before Council, and I think this is a, a good example of that. Um, your slide doesn't talk about um, at, at least half the things that, uh, um, that you talked about here in your, in your delegation. <clears throat> Some of the things in your delegation, your request for the City of Brampton to look at outside, um, uh, maybe hire outside people to come in and and look at, you know, the lighting situation that downtown and better. I I sit here today and I ask you to, and I challenge you to do that. Um, I don't think necessarily you need to go out and hire anybody, but I think that you, as the downtown BIA, need to come here and make those recommendations. Okay, um, we'd be happy to with, come back with those. And, and that's kind of Absolutely. what I'm saying in, in relation to seeing you more often, rather than having, you know, a 15-minute delegation <laughs> where everything is now getting lost into, into this one delegation. We were uh, 
we're sending it back to staff and for a lot of information for staff to now report mm -hmm. on. So um, I continue to ask you to come uh, uh, more often and uh, also with uh, some, of your, some of your requests that, um, again, I challenge the, the BIA to, to come to council and say, this is what we hear in the community. This is the work that we've done. This is our estimated cost. This is what we'd like council support on. We'd be happy to do that, and we'd, we would also be happy to document from a first impressions perspective of what consumers and residents see in our downtown with mm -hmm. visuals and, and with solutions to some of the, those areas. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Flushy, and uh, I think, thank you. I think we have a, um, a referral to, for staff. I, just a clarification to, through City Clerk, um, you had identified an Easter event or looking for in kind does is there a time in which uh, is, is this in terms of the staff report back is there some time consideration or time constraint yeah our Easter egg hunt is on Saturday April the 20th but we do have um, some some figures already from city staff on that particular event um, so I, I believe there's a staff report that will be sent back to council on that okay and I guess um, we have sit staff. Do staff just want to comment? This, I'm not sure if it would be prudent to, if you can come back specifically on the Easter portion and the other stuff, a more fulsome report. Uh, through the chair, we are ready with a report on the in kind ask and we're fully supportive, so we can come back on April 17th with that report. Was that enough time for BIA? Yeah, that's great. perfect. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. Uh, all in favor? Carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, what's our next one? 5.6, traffic concerns. So we have a delegation by Thomas Ingrig and Mr. Pritipal Gill. Good morning, councillors. Um, thank you for letting me speak today. I know it's been a long morning, so I'll make this quick as possible. With me today, I have uh, Mike Postick. He's a director and owner at Peel Standard Con Condominium Corporation 915. Maria Rampino, the president of Argo Property Management. Paul Gill, who's the, the president of PSCC 915. And myself, Thomas, uh, who's the property manager for this uh, a condo court. So we are here today to request the installation of a traffic light at PSCC 915. So PSCC 915 is a condo corporation consisting of six individual buildings with a total of 31 units situate, situated on Beauvert Drive West in between McLaughlin Road North and Chincuzzi Road in Brampton. So there's one entrance to the plaza off Beauvert which consists of six lanes of traffic traveling at a speed of 70 kilometers an hour, which and usually it's much more than that. Um, since there's no traffic light, it has become extremely dangerous for vehicles and pedestrians to access the plaza. Um, since I personally started managing this plaza about a year and a half ago, the first thing I noticed was how difficult and dangerous it is to enter and exit the plaza. So I reviewed the files for the corporation and discovered that correspondence from Randy Cole uh, from the Transportation Division of Region Peel dated back to 2012. Each time the corporation requests the installation of a traffic light from Randy Cole of the Region of Peel, uh, we get the same response, which is we do not meet the minimum requirements based off the volume of traffic. So the first thing I'd like you to consider is that the traffic survey doesn't take into consideration the foot traffic to and from the plaza. Out of the 31 units operating at the plaza, four of them cater solely to children. Two units belong to a daycare and another two units belong to an education, educational facility for children. Aside from uh, the children's facilities at the plaza, we also have restaurants, a pizza, a pizza store, a physiotherapy office, a grocery store, a dentist office, and many other establish, establishments that rely on foot traffic. So on a daily basis, hundreds of pedestrians, including young children walking to and from the plaza, are being put in jeopardy of being hit by a vehicle due to the safety conditions that exist in and around the plaza. 
Um, what also has to be considered is that during peak hours, traffic is re required to make a left turn into the plaza and a left out of the plaza. So due to heavy volume of traffic on Bouvier Drive, this turn can take five minutes. Uh, there have been numerous car accidents that have been witnessed firsthand by owners and tenants, and I'll let Mike elaborate uh, on that in a minute. So due to all these con safety concerns at the plaza, people are avoiding coming to the plaza altogether, which is hurting business drastically. The last thing that I would like to mention is that each unit paid a portion of a traffic uh, of a future traffic light when they originally bought their unit. So the amount of 120,000 was paid to the developer for a traffic light to be installed in the future. So if this plaza is being zoned to operate children's facilities, I think something has to be done immediately to avoid a tragedy from happening. Um, I have with me today, and I've passed on to Councillor Santos, uh, a petition from residents, owners, operators, suppliers, employees, patrons, customers, and parents that are pleading to have this issue addressed. And uh, I'll let Mike just briefly kind of explain what he sees because he's there on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, so I've been here for about nine years at the plaza. That's uh, how long it's been open. And uh, our clinic's open from 7 in the morning till 8 o'clock at night. So someone's always there in the plaza. We also face the street, so we always see everything happening in the street and hear accidents. Um, there's, uh, it's multifactorial. Uh, first of all, coming making the left out of the plaza. It's three lanes you've got to pass. There's this middle lane and then three more lanes. Uh, people are going 80 to 100 miles per hour. And a lot of people want to uh, go across six lanes to get to Chinkuzi because Chinkuzi is uh, shortly afterwards. Uh, so that causes one problem because a lot of people go into that island in between and they stay there. And you'll get sometimes two, three people out of the plaza coming together in that island, sometimes blocking traffic, um, as well as trying to merge in unsafely because you've got more than one. Uh, the other factor is it's the only spot that there is no island on the way past the Chinkuzi. So people are making U-turns uh, in that spot and sometimes they make U-turns across three lanes. Uh, so we've seen four accidents. Uh, one is from a U-turn that collided with someone making a right turn on the plaza. Uh, another one is making a right turn when someone collided with them, and we've got two left turns that have uh, had accidents coming out of that plaza as well. Uh, again, uh, like they were saying, we've got a daycare. Uh, we've got uh, Kumon that is extremely busy. We've got uh, our physio clinic has, has a lot of children after 4 o'clock. Uh, as well as we now have a large uh, restaurant beside us that is extremely busy. So busy. So lunchtime hours uh, are have a lot of people coming through, and then after four o'clock, is when we have um, traffic going back to about maybe six, seven, eight cars back uh, at any given time. Uh, so we do have. I know myself personally, and I've talked to the other owners. Uh, I have had people say I don't like booking after four o'clock because I can't get out of the plaza or into the plaza. Um, and in regards to that, so it is, it is affecting business uh, in a negative way as well. And uh, as I said, we did, uh, when it first opened, uh, there was an uh, amount allotted to a street light, uh, to a traffic light rather. Uh, so what we were looking for and asking for is uh, a uh, traffic light implemented as well as uh, across a, a trigger light, so it's triggered when people are there, as well as across the street, uh, possibly a bus stop, uh, so that it could be triggered by uh, pedestrians as well. Um, and then again, bus stop is also because there's children. It's also because there's injured patients coming in for uh, treatment as well as a doctor's office. It would also help accommodate these uh, individuals to be able to access the clinic safely. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Santos. Thank you through you, uh, Acting Chair. Thanks for coming in today. It's been um, a few months since we met over at the uh, plaza there. Thanks for coming in to delegate. Thank you for the petitions. I wanted to let you know that um, this intersection, this, this strip on Beauvaird came up at the region last week, um, where the region did a traffic study recently um, and also recommended to the region to reduce the speed limit on Beauvaird along that stretch of Beauvaird. So the speed limit is going to go down from 70 kilometers an hour to 60 which will certainly help. And so in addition to that, I'd like to refer this back to city staff as well as regional staff to help come up with uh, recommendations and a solution that will prioritize safety um, in, within this uh, entrance and exit of the plaza. Right, that's right. Councillor Pileschi has a friendly amendment. <laughs> um. Councillor Plushy. Thank you. As um, we can't refer anything to um, another government body, I guess the referral needs to speak to the effect that we ask staff to work with regional staff in um, in trying to implement 
safety procedures. Is that, so um, uh, that is kind of the friendly, and uh, but I'd like to talk about um, this uh, request a little bit, and, and I get it. Uh, we work with this throughout the city. Um, issues just like this, we have probably half a dozen in our area. Paul knows very well about uh, some of the issues that uh, that we have with. You know, this being a regional road, and I guess our uh, the city's perspective, and and you can correct me if I'm wrong, staff is, you know, we really want to see, I guess, those two um, holdout lots there uh, develop and make this kind of the a continuation plaza, uh, hopefully one day uh, in the future, much like just to the east of this, the LA Fitness, so something similar. A little bit bigger in size, but has a, a, a designated light uh, for that plaza. So, with monies that have been paid um, to the developer by the developer to the, I am assuming the region. Um, is it safe to say if this was our road, uh, we would be looking at implementing a light in the future because we've taken the, the funding once the development of the entire block uh, through you mr. chair that that would be correct yes we would look at uh, how to address that whole area and uh, I I haven't had conversations myself with the region but I would assume the region is having that same consideration and we would be happy to uh, to have that dialogue with them so in the past, we've come across um, matters like this where you know money has been paid, and it was the region on, on the case that I'm referring to as well, that uh, they had paid for, um, for lights to be put in, and they really needed the lights, even though the entire scope of the project hadn't been fully developed. So, and we went ahead and, and, and put those lights in because of you know the number of issues, safety concerns, traffic, um, I'm not a huge believer in lights on on roads like this, but that belief has to take uh, uh, the side approach to the fact that there are safety concerns. We need to resolve those safety concerns, um, and with the least amount of impact to the businesses, you know, it'd be a simple situation where we say, okay, it, it should be right in, right out, but that's an impact on business, and uh, and we're you know we want businesses to grow here in the city of Brampton, so. We offer up that support. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Pelushi. So we have uh, a referral uh, for a staff report um, by Councillor Santos and receipt of the delegations and petition. All in favor? Carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mayor Brown. We do have a large amount of individuals here from Rosedale uh, Village. I don't know if we have a there's an opportunity uh, to, to do this before before lunch if, if there's the willingness of council. Thank you, Mayor Brown. As acting chair, um, I will definitely take that uh, and put it to a vote uh, as a request. No, I'm sorry. What's the request? The request is that we go. Uh, we do not break at 12, as we have many residents from Rosedale Village. All in favor? Great. Yeah, we will do this one, and then we'll break for lunch. Is that first city clerk? What other the delegations we have? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, there are three additional delegations. The first are the villages of Rosedale. Second, are four delegations in regard to the LRT report. And there's a third delegation in regard to the staff report on the third transit shed. Okay. Do the LRT after. So I would Just suggest that let's do the Rosedale villages of Rosedale um, residents, and then we'll break for lunch following. So those who have signed up for delegations, please. Yeah. Uh, it's 5.7 delegation and handout from Rick uh, Wesselman, resident of uh, okay. Brampton. 
regarding Report 7.2.1. Great. Thank you. Please and welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and Councillors, for allowing us to uh, go ahead because uh, we do have a number of residents here and we aren't young. <laughs> But thank Council for the opportunity. Oh, I'm Joe Spina, by the way, for those that don't know me, a few of you do know. This is Rick Wesselman. Rick is the uh, President and Chair of the Villages of Rosedale Condominium Corporation. I'm uh, just a director on one of the uh, individual condo corporations, but Rick has asked me to be the uh, lead speaker on this. So thanks for the opportunity that was provided uh, last June and again today to discuss the issue of tax fairness on behalf of the 1,200 residential properties of the villages of Rosedale. We also thank city staff, particularly Martin Finnegan and David Sutton, for the thoroughness that was put into the research and writing of the report that you see attached there that the chair referred to earlier, 7.21. To refresh council on the villages of Rosedale, particularly those of you that uh, were not even on council last June, it is an adult lifestyle community whose demographic is about 90% retired residents, and I'm probably the average age of those residents at age 72. There's a mix of detached, semi-detached townhomes and eight low-rise apartment buildings. The community is a self-contained area within its gates and the villages of Rosedale provides services, maintenance and repair for all areas in the community with the exception of waste management and emergency services. Those are the only two municipal vehicles that come through our, gated, our gates at the uh, south end facing Sandalwood Parkway. Snow removal, street cleaning, infrastructure repairs, park landscaping, as well as the overall operations of the community are completely provided by private contractors hired by the villages of Rosedale. Unfortunately, the staff report presented does not address the fundamental underlying issue. That is, between property taxes and community fees, the residents of the villages pay a substantial premium in order to receive the same level of municipal services as compared to a home in a traditional neighborhood within the city of Brampton. We currently, and it was calculated also in the report, this premium to be about $1.9 million a year, with the final number expected to be over $2.5 million when the community is completed to 1,542 properties in the next few short years. City of Brampton directly benefits from the premium that is being paid in that it is not required to budget for providing services that we outlined in our initial presentation. Let me repeat that. We cover the costs of all maintenance including paying the hydro bill on our street lamps, for which the city of Brampton does not have to budget for. To put salt into the sort of proverbial wound, the main road that divides the villages of Rosedale into east-west halves, that is via Rosedale itself, has yet to be turned over by the city to the villages. However, the expenses associated with it are fully paid for by the residents in our total budget. While we agree that property taxes are based on market value assessment by MPAC, we also note that MPAC, as it is currently structured, does not factor in the expenses incurred by certain condominium communities in order to provide the same level of municipal services to a home in a traditional neighborhood even within the same municipality. 
That is to say, between the Municipal Act, MPAC, and the City of Brampton's current interpretation of the two, there are no mechanisms built into the process to address the fundamental disconnect of what the villages of Rosedale residents pay to achieve the same level of municipal services. As noted in the staff report, Section 365, subsection 1 of the Municipal Act allows a local municipality to pass a bylaw to provide a refund of taxes levied, levied that are considered unduly burdensome. The city passed bylaw 57 2010 under this section in 2010, and it was more recently amended under bylaws 254 2017 and 60 2018. However, the bylaws restrict eligibility requirements to low-income seniors and low-income persons with disabilities. We appreciate the reasons for this, particularly those of our residents who fit that category. However, our contention is that regardless of income, it is unduly unfair for any resident to pay twice for an equivalent level of municipal service within the same municipality. Our request then remains similar to last June. We ask to work with city staff on a bylaw amendment to the eligibility requirements of the rebate that addresses the fundamental issue of tax fairness as it applies to condominium communities like the villages of Rosedale and that city approached the region to pass a complementary bylaw. During the July 28th meeting with city staff, it was their recommendation that city oppose any changes to the Municipal Act. We ask that the city not oppose any organized action to amend the Municipal Act and the Impact Act to address tax fairness for condominium communities. We understand that what is being asked is part of a zero-sum game since any tax relief provided to the residents of the villages of Rosedale may be made up by other residential properties within the city. However, we also believe that the residents of the village should not be asked to balance this equation by paying their or our disproportionate share. While the villages of Rosedale scale makes it unique within the city, this dialogue is about fairness and other condominium communities should also be allowed to make their case to any amended bylaws. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this opportunity again. And that is the case that we are presenting to you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Plushy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Spina. It's nice to see you. Hi, Michael. You bring uh, you bring back a lot of uh, a lot of memories and, and the, amount of, the amount of work you did as a member of provincial parliament for uh, uh, the city of Brampton. Thank you for that service um, that you did. You know, when you get somebody of your stature come before us. Um, we really have to really think about um, some of the questions that you're asking and, and the support that you're requesting from the city of Brampton, um, because you know the you know you've been there, um, you get it, you understand it. So, um, I I'm going to ask for additional information, um, and I'm also going to uh, I'm going to ask if we we can bring that ref the report forward now. I don't specifically have questions of the delegation, but I would like to bring the report forward and talk to members of council and staff. Um, I'd like to request that we separate the um, uh, opposing the community of uh, um, requesting the province make changes to uh, uh, to condominiums. I don't believe that uh, you know. I think we should offer up some sort of support um, because what the residents are asking is is I think is fair um, I think it's fair in our point of view I'm going to ask that that staff uh, come back to council with more of a, I'd like to further understand you know some of the costs 
the, the, the corporation and, and the people that live there, um, they're absolutely right about the cost that they incur in living in the, in the community. Um, and, and the fact that we're not, we're not in there covering, uh, doing any of the actual work yet we're taxing uh, uh, on a basis as a, as a whole. But we don't have the numbers um, really to look at as they're still citizens of Brampton. You're not asking <coughs> to exit from Brampton. You're not trying to pull a Quebec or anything like that. So, <laughs> Although, <laughs> in speaking with a professor, uh, associate of mine who teaches municipal and government law, yes. He say he made that suggestion. He <laughs> said, "Why don't you separate from the city?" Yes. No, that's not that's not something we want to do. No. no. So services are you are being used um, by everybody in your community, outside the community. Um, so I think uh, I don't know how hard it is to put a dollar amount on that, um, but I think that's what I'm going to request staff uh, at least try to answer. And through the chair, there's there's probably about 121 communities, condo communities, and there's over 15,000 units. So it'd be significant. Mm -hmm. um, there'd be some time to put into that, but I'd also like to point out we'd be circumventing the provincial legislation and the assessment regime by doing so. Um, I, did, I, did, I haven't asked you to do anything yet okay. other than try to understand what that actual true, true number cost is. Um, the condominium corp and Rosedale is a little bit different when we're talking about buildings. Here we're talking about a gated community um, that have all of their internal services. So, you know, I don't believe that, um, I, I think this, I don't believe the city should stand in the way of condomin condominium corporations uh, requesting uh, changes in um, any kind of taxation to the province. I don't think that, uh, um, so I'd like to remove that from the uh, staff report and have it voted on separately, if I can. Um, but back to that, that true cost, to fully understand what that, what that is for, for the community. So through the chair to, to Councillor, you're, you're asking about their costs for snow plowing, for um, their lights. No, no, I'm not asking them. It's it's kind of what the but, relationship but, yeah. is, or the relation between our cost and uh, and and not having to go in and provide that service. If if I may, uh, Joe, uh, make a comment here, or Rick, do you want to uh, go ahead? Um, in the original presentation last June, mm -hmm. we did do a cost uh, summary of our budget for the operational functioning of the uh, village. And uh, in, in fairness to uh, staff, uh, David and Martin, Martin particularly did most of the research. Yeah. Um, um, in it, they did a, a very good job in highlighting the uh, costs and coming to the estimate, uh, as I mentioned, roughly $1.9 million. That's our number. That's our, and, That's our yeah, yeah, we and we provide a lot of that information because we disclosed uh, the numbers from our overall budget. So we're not looking for a complete refund here mm -hmm. because obviously we're still connected to the municipality. Yeah. What we are looking for is a portional rebate of some sort that we are not paying twice the, the amount of money for these services, for which the municipality is not providing anything beyond the gate. Sorry, I'm not sure if that helps. Uh, through the chair, just, just to be clear on that, I mean, it's common, we understand that, that communities, condominium communities, they, that's the, they're, they're responsible for what's inside their boundaries. Um, not unlike a house. Mm -hmm. A house is responsible for what's inside its boundaries. Uh, you own, a, you own a house, you, you, you want to save for a roof, you wanna, you're going to shovel your own driveway, or you're going to pay somebody to do it, uh, cut your own grass. If you've got uh, water issues to the road, you, you want to pay for those, it's 20 grand. I know somebody recently went through it. It's, it's a much bigger scale, you know, I understand that, but it's, when you look at it as a single property, it's not that different. 
Every, every homeowner has that responsibility, hopefully, if they're in the position to do so, to, to help save for things that come up down the road. Um, but the difference is... Oh, sorry, through the chair. Thank you. Through the chair. Thank you, sir. Through the chair, the difference is that it's not just the individual property that we are responsible for maintaining. And we, as residents, are responsible for maintaining our own house uh, sort of thing. It's the common area, the streets, the sidewalks, the curbs, the street lamps, the signage, and so forth, that is also being covered by the budget of the condominium corporation. Yeah. And through the chair, if I might add, um, the premise of, of the staff report is that the impact assessments account for all of this. So when our, let's say our house is valued at $500,000 in impact, it's the same, and, and that same $500,000 value is, is put on a house outside the community, that we pay the same taxes. But what we're saying and what we've highlighted here in our, in our response is we actually have a lot more. Because we, the slide that was just put up there, we're responsible for our own sanitary sewers. We're, own, we're, we're responsible for our own water supply street lights, curbs, sidewalks, roads. And that, and that is a fundamental disconnect that impact has, that it, it can't account for those costs that communities such as ours have to incur. So the, the most logical place that we've seen now is through some sort of rebate from the person who collects the taxes from, uh, from the residents. Okay, um, does staff want to comment further? I understand what, uh, through the chair, I understand yeah. what, what they're saying. Um, I, I see there's a lot of similarities, though. Obviously, uh, this, this is uh, the way that we've been uh, classifying properties since, uh, since Mr. Spina's government took over in 1996. Um, 95. <laughs> 95. <laughs> um, and we changed the act in 96. Right. Which you helped to frame. <laughs> That's right. Uh, at, at impact. In 1998, we, uh, we've had this property tax regime in place, and residential condominiums um, are in the residential tax class, like all others. There's houses, semis, golf courses. There's a myriad of things that fall into that classification under direction of the province. Um, rightly or wrongly, it, it seems to be working well. Uh, this is not a complaint we hear very often. It's uh, um, obviously there's a concern because people are, that are living within that see it as we're, we're providing services and paying for it that we folks outside aren't. I think when you look at it a little further than that, it's not entirely the case. We all are responsible for our own properties. And once we leave our properties, we all have the benefit of, of the community that we live in and the taxes that are supporting it. All of us do that. You, you, your, plow, your roads are getting plowed. You, you're getting your water. Um, you're getting your garbage, you're, you're driving on the roads. It's, uh, it's the benefit of all of us. We have police, we have fire. Um, the taxes support all of that. Taxes aren't a user-based system, as we know. It's there so we make sure everybody's got what they need to the best of our ability to provide it. Um, anytime we deviate from the set rules that we're all, that we're all responsible to, to, to follow in the province, not just, not just the city of Brampton, um, I, I'm, I have issues with that because I think we're, we're putting ourselves out there for one local issue when maybe we're not looking at the bigger picture. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Brown? Yes, uh, thank you. And thank you, Councillor Pleshi, for the um, substantive uh, questions. Uh, I appreciate the frustration uh, that you have. You've paid for an enhanced level of service uh, uh, that replicates uh, some of the city services, and there's no um, equalization for that. Now, I don't think what Councillor Plushy was asking for was to do anything that would be in contra contravention of the Municipal Act. We realize that the city's hands are tied into uh, some respects. What I heard from Councillor Plushy was that number three is removed, so that we're not saying we're not even going to lobby. It, it, number three says we're not even going to ask for the province for what uh, tools we have to, uh, to help this predominantly seniors uh, village. Uh, and so I, I agree with Councillor Plushy that number three should be removed because I'd like to know if uh, we have that discretion, if we have that ability. I'm sure there are lots of municipalities that are increasingly going to find um, similar situations where there is um, new ways to accommodate uh, 
uh, aging populations. And uh, I know Rosedale Village has been there for a while, um, and so you may be one of the first real test cases of why provincial legislation needs to be different. And so I don't think there's any harm in advocating to find out uh, um, if there is a willingness from the province to provide municipalities that, uh, um, that discretion. I'd also say I, I would like to find out what additional information, uh, um, getting additional information from, from staff in terms of what the real cost breakdowns are. Uh, I assume that when we have a snow removal contract, uh, we're paying for the city. Uh, what would the additional cost be for Rosedale Village versus what you pay? Because we, we get, we we're paying in bulk we probably get a, a, a better deal. And so I'd like to know what, what the, um, we certainly don't want everyone else going out and doing their own snow removal uh, contract and asking for a rebate for it. And so let's just get all the information on the table. And, and I think with that, we'll know what we're allowed to do from the province and we'll let to know uh, what the real uh, situation is for the city uh, financially. But uh, I certainly know visiting Rosedale Village, this was brought up uh, uh, all the time. And so this is, uh, uh, a legitimate concern that, that has been raised and we should do more to, uh, to look into it. And for that reason, um, I like where Councillor Pileschi is going on this. Um, I, I, we're certainly not talking about a grant today. We're talking about agreeing to lobby, agreeing to advocate, and to get all the information on the table. Is, is that a fair assessment of what you're asking for? Okay. Through, through the chair. Uh, yes. Comment. Um, we understand that this request is a little bit different from the original presentation. The reason that we approached the, uh, the grant refund issue was because we knew that was within the focus of council and its ability to make that change. We fully appreciate <coughs> what uh, David and Martin told us. Actually, they were really good in meeting with us one-on-one -on -one to discuss the issue. And we understand that the city can't change the Municipal Act or MPAC. However, if there was one small change made to the Municipal Act taxation, the only flexibility you have as a municipality is your categories and the tax range that's applied to your categories, industrial, commercial, and residential. You have the ability to vary industrial and commercial categories, but you do not have any flexibility with respect to the word residential. And as a result, all residents are lumped into that category and into that same rate. And if that was able to be distinguished, condominium communities of whatever type, then that would give the municipality the authority to apply the varying tax rate as they do with industrial commercial properties. Thank you. Um, Mayor Brown, are you off the board? I am, thank you. Okay, Councilor Vicente. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a question through you to staff. In the report, uh, it states here that uh, an issue like this <coughs> is best led by organizations such as Condominium Authority of Ontario or other condominium owners associations. Um, if we were to add our voice to theirs, it mentions here that it would not be prudent. Can you explain why? Through the chair, um, one municipality out of 450 um, comes down to, to that. Um, for us to start lobbying other municipalities to see if this is something that they'd be interested in doing, in, in effect, you'd be looking at creating a, a new class for, for residential condominiums that would be at a lower tax ratio than the residential class. For pretty much every municipality across the province, that's going to mean an increase in, in taxation for the remaining residents of, in the residential class. In Brampton, 77% of that would be borne by, by, our, by our residents in that class. Um, I don't, my opinion, I, I don't see, because in the, in the time that I've been in this business, I haven't heard of it as been a, a hot topic item. It's, this is really the first where folks have come as far as Mr. Spine and Mr. Wesling have come. 
Um, I have not heard it from other municipalities. If I was to hear it anywhere, I, I'm sure Toronto and Mississauga would be forefront, uh, not the city of Brampton with, with what we have in terms of stock and residential condominiums. So just my opinion. Um, I, I believe if the condominium organizations are, are willing to make that effort, um, I think that would have a, a more um, pull than one single municipality which isn't even near the top of the, the heap in terms of residential condominiums in its community. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to staff. So to date, are you aware of any effort by any of these uh, owners' organizations to lobby to the province or to, for example, uh, work with AMO uh, and other such organizations to see how this can be achieved, these, these objectives? Uh, through the chair, the short answer is no. No. Um, typically, you're, you're, you're dealing with the hot topic items that you, you have to deal with. Um, we don't need to actually go looking for them. They find us. And uh, uh, this is not one that's been, that's been raised with us in, in, in any of the time that I've been here. Um, another aspect to this that I think uh, caught our attention is if it is this council's uh, wish to seek some more information from staff, I think that uh, some consideration then should be also given or paid attention to with respect to uh, how we treat uh, differently uh, higher density condo, uh, condominium properties as opposed to a lower density gated community like this one. Uh, in, in essence, a condominium also has a, a closed front door, it's a private property, uh, but uh, you would have uh, 300 units in a much smaller footprint than, for example, um, this property uh, has, and therefore would the, the break on the tax rates, if the, gov if the government of Ontario were to grant it, of course, <coughs> the house, uh, that probably should be looked at and addressed, perhaps treated differently. Just my thoughts. Um, through the chair, yeah, yeah. potentially. Um, it's hard to, to answer that in one way or another. It's, it remains to be seen, but again, they would be in their own class. There would be, the uh, if this was to happen, municipalities would have the opportunity to determine a ratio. Uh, the ratios flow through the, the legislation to, into the tax rates. Um, once we get to that point, once you're in that category, the tax rate from the municipality that's passed by council is what's going to be applied. Um, that, nothing would change unless they actually change the way we're taxing. And I don't believe that's what they're asking for. They're asking for a new classification. Or that's what their, the, their end hope would be, is to have a classification separate from the residential group. And, and, and then all of those condominiums, whether they be high rise, they'd be all treated the same. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I look uh, forward to seeing how the motion may be tailored. Thank you, Councillor Vicente. Councillor Flush. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I'd just like to uh, introduce the, the motion, if we can get it up on the screen, and just remind uh, Council that uh, City of Brampton is seen as a leader and not a follower. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can I move that the chair be heard? So moved. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin. I, I, I guess from what I'm understanding this, um, Mayor Brown and Councillor Pileshi, you've talked about this council taking on the role of advocating for legislative changes um, that I'm not sure if I understand correctly, no other municipality. Um, I, I guess my concern, it's one thing to get um, uh, to get more information. I'd be more comfortable getting more information on the implications, understanding what that would be across the city before we go advocate to a third party or to other authorities. Uh, through AMO, uh, as the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, they have not come forth and given any position on this. Um, so the, the way it's worded, um, I guess my concern would be um, we're basically saying that we're taking a position on this issue and empathizing with what the residents are facing, but we don't understand what the implications are for the city. Well, I'll, 
Yes. 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 Chair, if this motion as constructed were to carry, it is simply referring the report back to staff mm -hmm. to do two things, to provide further research, inclusion of associated costs, and also to report back on possible advocacy opportunities. This would not give direction to staff or the city to do, actually do advocacy. That would still have to be a future decision of council. That's right. And, and I guess through the chair, or as the chair, to get the clarification, possible advocacy opportunities for legislative <coughs> changes would require us to have a position, to formulate a position. <coughs> so I, I don't, my concern, and Martin, you can uh, uh, maybe provide comment. If we're going to develop an advocacy strategy, that requires that we take, adopt a position. And I don't think this council has adopted a position for us to do any advocacy. So before we get into that stage, I would assume that you know, so if we split the motion and take out the possible advocacy, that's one thing to get information and then after we adopt a position and then we can go forward. But right now, I don't plan on advocating for something I don't know nothing about. So why would we develop a strategy for advocating in legislative changes? And I guess what I don't see here as well is advocating to who, uh, would be MPPs, uh, others level of government. So that, that is my concern. So I guess if we split it, um, that would deal with it. But do you understand, uh, Martin, what, uh, I guess, if you can comment on what I was saying? It's just... Through the chair, I, I do I understand your, what you're basically saying is let's get the, the numbers and the information and then and make an informed decision on whether or not advocacy is, is something that this council wants to proceed with. Exactly. I can say that the first part of that will take some time and uh, we really need to understand what it is that we're looking at in terms of comparing these costs. And I'm not certain that we're just looking at the villages of Rosedale. Is that just the villages of Rosedale, or are we looking at all the condominiums? Because potentially you're you're opening it up to all the condominiums, not just one. And so I guess even the definitions and and who these are <laughs> would be quite a challenge as well. Yes. Okay. I got no further comment, Councillor Williams. Um. Yes, thank you to you, Chair. I think um, I'm, I'm just wondering about maybe like requesting for um, collaboration with through AMO, um, just to hear their input and um, you know, or just kind of feel up that information to to know whether or not this is something they're considering. Um, so I'm just wondering if more of a collaborative um, approach to that this motion. Um, yeah, so because I, I would, I think it would be very helpful to know how much the city pays to, um, or how much the city is saving by not having to pay for the residents not having to pay for the services, or sorry, by what they're paying already. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but I think it, it, it's, I think it's also really important for us to start that conversation with with Amo because you know we could be moving in a direction where. Um, we have to change the formula, you know, and um, and what formula would be supportive of creating a new different category, um, such as you mentioned earlier, like a condo corporation. So I'm just wondering about, uh, I think it's important for the advocacy, but also the um, collaboration piece with other municipalities through EMO and such, or starting that conversation. Thank you, Councillor uh, Councillor Pelleschi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it, Peter, if you can just correct me if I'm wrong, the way this um, referral uh, reads, and with comments from the mayor, that we're we're looking for the additional information, the information that members of comment, members of council have have requested, and then at that time, once we receive that information, then we will ter determine. The next steps on advocacy. I don't think we need to know who we need to advocate to. I think there's only really one body, but what the advocation, what it actually looks like, will be determined after we receive that information. Through you, Mr. Chair, I believe the motion as constructed would um, all it would do today is ask staff to report back on these two points, and staff would not be taking any action. 
um, on advocacy or anything else until council makes a future decision based on a future report. Thank you. Council Vicente. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, it just as a suggestion to staff that if, uh, if this motion is passed, I think that this would be an ideal project uh, instead of staff devoting resources to something like this, which isn't immediately necessary. Uh, perhaps this would be an excellent project for an intern uh, position or youth position that we may have at the city for them to undertake the research and to provide their view on how to proceed on this. And this is an excellent project for someone to, to undertake. Thank you. Okay, there's no comments, uh, so we have a motion uh, on the floor. Um, I have requested uh, separation of A and B. Um, all in favor of part A? Carried. All in favor of part B? Two. Against? Yeah, so vote A, so vote B again. So uh, as part of the report, Concerning advocacy opportunities for legislative changes. All in favor? Carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. And motion to receive delegation? Carried. Fifteen. Thank you. Huh? Okay, welcome again. Uh, we now move on to uh, item 5.8, uh, delegations uh, regarding stock report 8.2.1, Her Ontario Main Street, LRT. Uh, so I believe our first uh, person is uh, Jason Audi from Layuna. Welcome. Sorry. Oh, my uh, excuse me. My apologies, Councillor Williams. Um, yes, the, uh, to the chair, I had asked for 8.2.5 to be pulled out of consent. Um, but I was able to speak with um, the Commissioner of Public Works and they've answered my questions, so I no Deal longer need to deal with it at that time? Yeah. Okay. That's good. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Uh, Mr. Audi, welcome. 
And as a reminder, you will have five minutes unless more time is moved to, to be given. Thank you very much. So I'll just start. Good afternoon, members of council. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today about uh, this item. I just want to tell you a little bit about Leuna Local 183. Very brief background. Um, Leuna Local 183 is the largest construction local in North America. We have 58,000 members, many of whom call Brampton home. Um, our, geographic, uh, our geographic distribution is pretty much across the GTA, going all the way from Burlington, out east to Kingston, and all the way north to Simcoe, so it's very broad. Our members perform work specifically in the heavy civil sector, in the residential sector, and in the tunneling sector. That's uh, 183 literally got its birth and foundation in building this, the uh, City of Toronto subway system. And it was at that time when the work conditions were horrendous. Um, the, the leadership said that was enough and decided to start a very small union of 400 members and today we've grown to 58,000. On the LRT issue, we have been involved in this issue from the get-go. I remember four years ago, I believe it was at Rose Theatre, we had a very, um, let's call it uh, divisive, there was a very divisive debate about the LRT. And at that time, you will recall that uh, Layuna, specifically Local 183, had deputed about the importance of proceeding with the LRT based on the routes that were f afforded to them. So at that time, there, were, uh, there was an issue with Metrolink saying that this was the route, and there was obviously um, no resounding commitment from the community about how they wanted to proceed. It was divided. But one thing that wasn't discussed was an idea of a tunnel. And increasingly, what we're hearing and what we've heard is that this tunnel idea of tunneling the LRT really did seem to tie those members of council who were opposed and the people who were in favor of a surface mount seemed to agree that the tunnel option would be the best option, all things being considered. I'll remove the self-interest. Obviously, from 183's perspective, we would love to see a tunnel. The, the self-interest aside, there are some merits in tunneling this project that would not only resolve the disputing aspects in the community, but would also provide Brampton first order, higher order transit. And at the same time, I think, meet a lot of the construction difficulties that a surface mounted route would create. Bearing the tunnel allows traffic to continue to flow. It uh, minimizes disruption to businesses along the route and is generally much more favorable to communities. If you look back to the City of Toronto, uh, if they could fast forward today, they would say to themselves, we should have buried the gardener. It's a constant discussion at the City of Toronto. We would love to bury the gardener. We shouldn't have buried the gardener. Today, Brampton Council has that opportunity. I would encourage you to explore that opportunity because as long as this option exists, if council decides to pursue another option without fully exploring the tunnel option, it will never be a decision that will bind the community. People will say, yes, we have this LRT, but it would have been better to have a tunnel. So I implore council to take the time that is necessary to put every energy and effort towards exploring the idea of tunneling that section of the LRT. If that fails, then that's a different discussion because now residents can say, hey, we've explored the option. Unfortunately, this doesn't work. Now you're talking about do we want LRT or not? So I, I, that's the sort of sum of my remarks, and I'm willing to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Brown. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Chair, and Jason, thank you for uh, being here today. And I just want to know... First of all, this is quite significant. You have one of the, uh, Leona 183, which I think we all have a great deal of respect for, uh, but we're one of the biggest advocates for modern transit in, 
in Brampton during this, this last debate. And um, this recognition that uh, the tunnel is doable and possible, um, uh, given that you were so vocal in favor of um, the surface route is something that I, that I think everyone on council needs to take uh, quite seriously. And no one knows how to build things in terms of uh, surface or tunnel. No one knows how to build this and get this done better than Leuna. This is their expertise. They know this upside down. When they say um, that uh, we can do this with minor disruptions to business, um, that when there is obstacles, I heard the word obstacles that exist for surface that we can uh, alleviate through a tunnel, that's significant because Leona has done it everywhere. Um, is there another organization that has built as much in terms of surface or tunnel anywhere in Canada other than Leona? No, this is, this is literally our bread and butter. Yeah. We do this uh, in jurisdictions, not just in the GTA. Um, a lot of times contractors who have agreements with us will take members uh, with them abroad because our expertise is second to none. The second thing I would say that I, I took as quite um, instructive from your comments is the debates at Toronto City Hall, they, they, when they were talking about their transit challenges, they always go back to if only they buried the gardener all those years ago. I, I remember listening to a debate where they talked about the Allen Expressway, how they talked in the 70s it was going to go down into the city. And right now I know we're intimidated by the cost associated with transit. Fast forward 20 years from now. Fast forward 20 years from now, you look at this cost and it will seem insignificant. Down the road, you don't look back at public transit investments and say, I wish I didn't do that. Frankly, you say, thank goodness that we did. And if we're gonna do this, you, you get one shot at it, you wanna do it right. Um, and uh, that's why I'm so grateful that you're, you're, you're here today. Um, and know that you're a respected stakeholder uh, in this process and, uh, and your words, uh, I think, carry a lot of weight. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Brown. <clears throat> Councillor Santos. Thank you. Through you, <clears throat> through you, Chair, just a quick question. Sure. Um, the jobs uh, related to the uh, tunnel, there will be jobs, obviously. Will, are there going to be jobs created with the surface route as well? No, absolutely. I mean... Um, like, I, like I had mentioned before, self-interest aside, we'd love to see a tunnel because there's more jobs, longer duration, um, uh, that would be offered by the tunnel. But that being said, our members do a lot of the light rail transit surface, mount, surface mounted as well. We're doing it for Crosstown. There, there's an element, obviously, of tunneling, but we're also doing the... Um, we, our contractors are, are bidding and it looks like they'll be successful on the Finch LRT and other aspects. So, I mean, our members do perform both work, but from a, you know, being from a, being literally here with some of you back then four years ago and seeing how divided the community was on the surface mounted route. And four years now, we're seeing an opportunity that will actually tie the community together. I thought it would be a great opportunity to tell you where Leuna stands and about what our preference is in terms of tunneling. And is there, um, <clears throat> and maybe we'll bring this up later in the, um, when the report comes to the table, but in your experience uh, between surface route and like tunneling options, um, is there more of a delay or is there somewhat in terms of timing for a transit to be built and <clears throat> jobs to be created given the circumstance we're in now in Brampton? You're talking about the front end work in terms of uh, the planning associated with tunneling versus Correct. surface mount? <laughs> I'm not an engineer. Um, I do know that uh, when there's a commitment to tunneling, there's a, an, a, a bunch of considerations that are taken into, into account. But those considerations are taken into account as part of the, the build-out process in terms of they try and identify those, those, those areas that will require extra technical expertise mm -hmm. prior to. But I will say on an LRT design, um, surprises happen as well. So. In fairness, is it longer? Yes, the, the volume of work is more, and that does take longer, but the quality of the asset that you have at the end of it more than justifies any potential delay. Okay, and then the cost of tunneling versus surface? <clears throat> no, I mean, I think it's self-evident that a tunnel does cost more than a surface mounted. I mean, 
uh, we wouldn't be here before you today, or I wouldn't be here before you today, because I think you would all uh, realize that that um, if they were if they were equal, the tunnel would mm -hmm. be the better option. The tunnel does cost more. There's no way to to sugarcoat that. But the asset that you get at the end of it is better for the city, in okay. our opinion. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you, Councillor Santos. Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair. Um, so thanks for explaining some of the, the t options around tunneling. I'm just wondering, like, we, we often see or hear about tunnels in larger cities, and, and Brampton is a large city, but we're quite sprawled out, and we haven't done a, a lot of our intensification as yet. So I'm just wondering around, um, it, you know, the impact to a city that looks like Brampton, and, and have you seen it done in a city similar to Brampton? You know, the, the um, technical expertise and equipment around tu tunneling has gotten so sophisticated and um, the sort of economies of scale have, have been created that tunneling now can be done in very small communities because it's not, it's the, the, the amount of work that was done, let's say, in the 1950s or was all done by hand, no, no machinery. That doesn't exist today. A lot of it is there's a tunnel boring machine, there's um, facilitated equipment to bring out debris. Uh, they're no longer casting concrete in place. They're bringing in concrete, and, uh, it, uh, not tunnels, but basically uh, preformed concrete and, and, and laying those foundations. They're seaming those where the technology prevents vibrations. So there is, um, in terms of size, Brampton on its size today is not an issue. But I think the Brampton of tomorrow as it grows, and as you know, intensification is a big push. Tunneling allows you to intensify around higher order transit. Um, some of those become a challenge with surface mount. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Um, as I see now, there's no further comments or questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Adi. Oh, Council. Um, I'm, I'm off the board yet. Would you like to speak, Councillor Fertini? No. You sure? I think we would benefit. Oh, thank you, Ms. Roddy. We appreciate it. Thank you. Um, our next is uh, Lisa Stokes, please. Good afternoon, Mayor Brown and councillors. My name is Lisa Stokes, and I'm a Brampton resident and, resident and mother of four. Two of my children have left Brampton to attend McMaster University and feel there is little to draw them back to Brampton. This saddens me, but I am optimistic that this council is interested in changing that. I am here to urge you to move forward with light, rapid transit expansion for Brampton. This will be the sixth time I have addressed council on this issue. I read the March 21st statement by Metrolinx and think it is great news for Brampton because the Here Ontario LRT continues to move forward. I delegated in favor of the HMLRT in June, July, and October of 2015 because I believe it will benefit Brampton. I also delegated in February of 2017 to speak out against wasting money studying alternative routes and in December to speak out against studying a tunnel option. That's why I am here again. This time, my specific request is that you ensure the LRT north of Steeles on Main Street can start as soon as possible. Staff wrote that the 2015 environmental assessment is still valid. That's great news. I'm tired of waiting for Brampton to join other big cities in Canada, like Ottawa, Edmonton, Calgary, Toronto, and Waterloo Region to have an LRT. The key benefit of using the 2015 environmental assessment is that it gives us the best chance of starting construction soon. Of course, I support the federal government joining the provincial government in funding LRT from Brampton Go to Port Credit. Your own Brampton Transit ridership shows that Brampton has done a lot of things right to grow its ridership and to move on to the next step. 
I applaud this council for taking bold action. At your very first meeting, you voted to build a network across Brampton. This is about more than one line, but getting shovels in the ground now on Main Street north of Steeles will leverage the opportunity for those other lines in your December 2018 motion. In 2015, I took pictures of almost 100 Brampton residents with signs saying, I support HMLRT for my delegation. Remember that 66% of morning peak hour trips are within Peel region. Brampton Transit riders want action. We need frequent high capacity vehicles like light rail vehicles and buses in their own right of way to move people and local bus routes to connect those spines. It's actually a very simple issue. Will you be leaders and build now? I can't support a tunnel for Main Street because it wastes too much time, time we don't have. It wastes too much money, money we don't have. We can't look at other jurisdictions and say, they get a tunnel, so we should. That's not evidence-based planning. As a taxpayer and transit user, you need to think carefully about the decisions you make. Let's focus on building a network in Brampton rather than a short, cost-intensive tunnel. Toronto is a cautionary tale that change in cost, scope, and technical studies can happen after these projects begin. I've seen the cut and cover construction on Eglinton and the massive utility re relocation for deep trenches for the Crosstown LRT. It's a mess. It's been a mess for years. It's not done yet. I encourage you to take a look at the Crosstown Toronto Twitter account to see the massive hole that has to be dug at the beginning of the tunnel and the end to drop those machines in and to see the size of the tunnel that would have to be dug under Main Street. The type of disruption that we see on Eglinton won't help local businesses in Brampton, and it's not worth the risk when the 2015 environmental assessment is still valid and surface LRT on Main Street would be fantastic. You have a choice. You can act and actually present something for funding that's shovel-ready this year or wait to see what happens in the mid-2020s. Brampton decided to wait in 2015. Let's move forward now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Brown. Thank you, um, Chair. A few comments were made there. Just wanted to get staff's feedback on, um, maybe to the CEO. Uh, the first uh, comment that was made is that uh, uh, the EA is ready to go, and it would be. I'm sorry. Could you speak up a bit? You said that the comment you made was the EA um, was ready to go, and that there's. And this would be faster. I want to ask the CEO, given uh, the pause on the downtown reimagined, uh, could that not conceivably um, affect our ability uh, um, and, uh, and readiness uh, for, the, for, for the surface? So it may not be, um, it may not be uh, ready to go. Through the, through the chair to the mayor, that, that is a fair statement to, okay. to assess. There are a number of unknowns that we need to address and quantify and determine what implications they have. And given the delays, and I'm cognizant that there's an update in camera, so I, I can't have you speak to that, but um, can the city definitively say how long that delay is going to be? Through the chair at this time, I do not believe we can accurately say how long that delay would be. So when I hear that, if, if you were presented with the option that the tunneling option is faster, would that change your perspective at all? I, I, to, to Lisa. <laughs> um, if I was told the tunneling option was faster than a surface option, yes. uh, it would impact my concern with how long it's going to take us to build uh, higher order transit on main streets, but it would not alleviate my concern with the cost of a tunnel versus a surface route. Okay, and the reason I asked because the comment was the uh, urgency was, was, was important to you. The second thing I wanted to, wanted to, to say is, um, and maybe the CEO can answer this, or actually maybe the community services, based on, um, on the presentation that we had, staff information, would the, um, would the active transportation that was planned originally, 
um, is that is, is that now removed from the project? So the, so the bicycling pass? Because we heard earlier today we want to have bicycling pass in the downtown. Um, does, the, does the surface option as presented take that away now? Uh, through the chair, the, um, the TPAP approved alignment uh, reuses the existing four lanes today. So the curbs where they are today will remain and you cannot accommodate uh, cycling So no, paths. no, no cycling paths. It could be very That's disappointing right. for our downtown. Um, this, would it cancel the street? Do we have the ability to do streetscaping if we did surface? Uh, through the chair, the pedestrian uh, realm, so the widening of the sidewalks uh, would not happen. Okay. You may be able to get some of the uh, landscaping elements perhaps in, we have mm -hmm. to look at that. Mm -hmm. But that's probably about the only part that you could accommodate uh, okay. with the TPAP approved alignment. Well, that's very important to know. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Councillor Santos. Thank you, through you, Chair. Just, just about the cycling in the downtown core. So I ride my bike downtown uh, all the time in the summer with my son, and I don't take Main Street at all because I take the Etobicoke Creek Trail, Ken Williams, which goes down through Rosalie Park, the YMCA, and then the downtown Brampton. So as a cyclist herself, um, who cycles downtown often, is a cycling lane even necessary to get downtown on Main Street? Um, it isn't necessary. There are alternatives. There are lots of small, low-volume low roads that uh, run parallel to Main Street, as well as the Etobicoke Creek Trail. We also have uh, Riverworks as uh, something that would potentially uh, be coming forward in the future and uh, would hopefully have cycling infrastructure in it for the 600 meters of the diversion channel so that people wouldn't even need to exit the Etobicoke Creek Trail anymore to cycle through downtown Brampton. Great. And then the, the cycling uh, proposal that uh, the community and staff, myself, that we've been working on that we showed today, the routes itself goes along Vauden, which is pretty north of where, uh, well, somewhat north of where the downtown core is and Vauden then connects to Ken Willens and all those other sections that then feed into the downtown core. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So in, in your opinion, um, if a cycle lane is not um, available to accommodate a surface route of the LRT, can cyclists still get downtown Brampton? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, for example, you know, I am a um, very comfortable vehicular cyclist. Uh, however, when I came uh, to City Hall this morning on my bike, uh, I wasn't on Main Street at all. I came uh, uh, down um, Church, Union, uh, Theatre Lane, and then across Queen, and then came across Wellington and into the parking garage. So even, even with Main available, I didn't use it today. Thanks so much. Thank you, Councillor Vicente. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question to the staff. The streetscaping that was uh, conceived of and implemented into the downtown reimagine. <clears throat> um, in the HMLRT plan for the area, specifically at the four corners, what degree of streetscaping was provided in that concept and in that plan? Uh, through, through the chair, uh, as part of the TPAP approved EA, uh, we did contemplate uh, boulevard trees along there. Sorry? We did contemplate boulevard trees, okay. uh, but that's the extent of it, as part of the TPAP approved alignment. And what other elements could, were, were present in the design of the streetscaping for Maine and Queen? Uh, through the chair, it was um, it was only the EA stage, so it was still very very preliminary. Whereas the downtown reimagine obviously got into a lot more detail because it went through detail design. Uh, there was you know um, replacement of the sidewalks, uh, but that's probably about the extent of it, as well as the the trees themselves. And this is just behind the curbs. So, if if council were to make a decision to go with one route or another route or a tunnel, um, given that that's what presented in the staff report. Are there still opportunities for elements of downtown reimagined to be implemented in such a streetscape design? 
Uh, through the chair, the TPAP al alignment basically allows you maybe the opportunity to put some trees in, but that's about the extent of it. Uh, so with that alignment, that's, that's all you're going to get. The other alignments allowed you various um, uh, levels of the downtown reimagined to be incorporated. So if you want, I can explain that further if you like. Or... So, so would we have to compromise, for example, on the finishes of the materials? Uh, through the chair, no. That could still be done. Uh, we would have to compromise on the width of the sidewalks. Uh, through the chair, words, through the chair words, compared to downtown reimagined, yes, they'd be the same as pretty much what you see today. Um, based on uh, through your chair, we wouldn't need to compromise on the tree canopy component. Uh, through the chair, I, I don't think you're going to get as many, only because of the tree. Um, uh, I'm going to say tree pits, but. Um, just the trees themselves. You won't be able to probably get as many, but you, we, we, that, that'll be something we'll have to look at as part of, part of, our, part of our design. How, okay. how much space do you have left in the sidewalks to accommodate those trees? And to what degree would there need to be compromises made along the Queen Street um, portion of the four corners? Uh, so through the chair, the Main Street LRT does not uh, impact Queen Street ex except at the intersection itself. So. In other words, along Queen Street, you could proceed with downtown reimagined components as previously designed? Uh, through the chair, that's correct. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, our next delegation is Mr. Dave Patel. Good afternoon, Councilor. staff, members of the public. First of all, thank you for giving me the opportunity to say a few words here. As you know, downtown is very close to my heart. And the reason it's close to my heart is because the city of Brampton is very close to my heart. And if downtown suffers, the city of Brampton suffers. And if this, this council suffers, the city of Brampton suffers. If this council gets divided on this issue, the city of Brampton suffers. Employment suffers. Taxes will suffer. Businesses will suffer. I'm confident the council we have is a united council so far. Almost every single time I've seen things have been very positive. We do have a reasonably good looking council as well. Actually, a very good looking <laughs> council. Um, and it's, uh, you know, for the first time when I, whenever I listen in the council, I see people participating, like the questions you guys are asking is beautiful. I haven't seen that in the past. I see a lot more now. And which is nice because I think you guys are working together. It's a pleasure mm -hmm. to see that. But I think that tone needs to continue all the way for LRT as well. Because if you don't do that, the repercussions of it is absolutely enormous. We saw last four years, the city got nowhere because of this divisive issue. Um, I, let me just mix it. Take my notes. Give me a second. I just got carried away. Um, I think uh, before you guys make a decision, I think it's going to be crucial for you guys should consider, consult with uh, the stakeholders, other stakeholders. I think you need to consult with public as to should we go the tunnel route or should we go the surface route. Because we don't even know, like in my, when I'm, I was sitting and listening to some of the things came, coming up, like we don't know the cost of surface route for downtown. We have no idea. We, for all we know, we could have a huge hole in downtown Brampton for the next five, six years because the ground is not secure. We all know that now. So tunnel route makes it much safer. I'd rather have four guaranteed years than six years of a hole. You know, the businesses, the buildings can drop. Who's going to guarantee those? Where's the cost going to come from that? Like we're talking about tunnel costing. Other cities have received billions of dollars. Why not Brampton? We're the ninth largest city in Canada. I think you guys are strong enough, powerful enough. You have enough business community, enough Brampton folks behind you to go and fight with you and for you with other stakeholders. I don't think we should worry about the cost for tunneling. I think we need to, it's a much safer and secure route. So I think you need to, like the business community, this is what the business community wants. They prefer a tunnel route. They do not prefer the surface route. 
uh, when Council Vicente was asking um, one of the staff members regarding the streetscape, you know, the, if, if you listen, we're looking at if, if, if the uh, on service we get, what do we have? We have the same downtown road we have today. Maybe a few trees on the side. And as long as this downtown is not the way it's supposed to be, the city will never be where the way it's supposed to be. Because downtown is the heart of a city. People look at Toronto because they look at downtown. They don't look at DuPont and they don't look at other areas. They say downtown Toronto, oh, that's the place to be. This is what Brampton needs to be. We have three million people north of us. South of Georgian Bay, everybody, this is, should be their downtown. But we have to make it attractive for them, for them to be this our downtown. Businesses can come from out all those places. We don't need to compete with Toronto. We don't need to worry about Mississauga. We need to have all those, all those Orangeville, everybody basically come here. This should be our downtown. So we have to make it sexy. The reimagined program was beautiful. Widening the sidewalks, having some patio, uh, you know, restaurants, some patio stones, you know, some boulevards, some, some trees in between. That's what we need in the city. And it's up to us to change that. And I think you guys will make the right decision. I'm confident. Like, I hate to see any one of these councillors leave this in the next election. I sincerely mean that. And I think if we make the wrong decision, it is going to impact some people. And I don't think we need, we need that. And our city is united, let's united, let's keep on working. Um, so I really request that uh, you guys ask for a public consultation. I don't know, if, I don't know what we need to do for that. And uh, same for uh, stakeholders of con consultation. Um, open to questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kapal. Uh, Councillor Willens. Yeah, thank you, David, for coming in. Just, uh, just briefly, how much have you got invested in downtown? Maybe 15 million. Thank you. Are there no further questions? And I can see it going down the drain, by the way. <laughs> it goes the wrong uh, way. Thank you, Mr. Kapal. Doesn't seem to have any further questions or comments. Uh, so at this stage, thank you. At thank this you. stage, it'd probably be the right time to bring staff report 8. Point. Oh, there is another delegation. Oh, my apologies. Mr. Rick Evans, please. I'm a little unprepared as I'm a latecomer having come back from London, England, to meet with this debate again. For those of you who may not be familiar, I have been a strong supporter, a vocal supporter of LRT from when it was announced, with only one condition, that it come to our downtown. I found an LRT ending at Steeles Avenue useless in terms of the benefits to Brampton. I continue to support an LRT coming to and through our downtown. But now, having been through the long process, the process of education and evaluation in the downtown reimagined project, and beginning only to understand, because I'm certainly no engineer, but beginning to only to understand the complications that our Main Street presents to any level of construction that requires digging says to me that for us to ignore the option of a tunnel is going to give us a lifetime of doubt and may give us half a decade of complications digging up from the surface down Main Street. I implore you to consider, to continue to consider, the tunneling. You heard me concerned to no extent about the delays that have gone on in redeveloping our downtown for 35 years. I am the last person who wants a delay in anything that is going to be an improvement to this downtown. But I heed the words that a delay 
is better than a lifetime of doubt if we're going to get better value. Cost has been generally addressed, and we all know a tunnel is going to cost more. But in my business, I have been taught selling insurance, everything everybody loves to know, from when I entered this business, that you don't sell cost. You sell value. I can give you the cheapest price and the least protection. You want it? If a tunnel is going to give us greater opportunities and greater value to develop this downtown, I implore you, consider it. If it turns out to be rotten, throw it away. But I don't know it's rotten. In fact, I wonder if it's going to blossom. I don't know where the money's going to come from. But I do know that Brampton's been ignored for not a decade, for two decades. We have to a lot of back to we've got a lot of back funding to collect, let alone future funding. We have a provisional government who thinks they can go and dig tunnels all over Toronto, and they can't, Brampton? I'm confused. I'd like to see that in the front page when 900,000 people are going out to vote. That's the general area around us that will be affected. So I won't say I beg, but I do implore you to consider tunneling as an option. And if it is rotten, throw it out. And if it's not rotten, Go get the money. Any Thank questions? you, Mr. Trevor, for uh, Mayor Brown. Thank you for the very passionate uh, presentation, and we know uh, how devoted you are to downtown uh, Brampton through the uh, challenges and, and, and the hope. Um, you've been one of the people that I think has uh, shown uh, uh, how, uh, how dedicated you are to, to seeing our downtown flourish. How disheartening would it be uh, if uh, the downtown reimagined had to be shelved. But what, what would the what what would the response in the downtown be towards uh, that, uh, or even even not just shelved if it had to be cut in half or um, or minimized? Um, you all know I hung my hat on downtown reimagined, and yes, it is from passion, and I have a growing impatience. Uh, my brother does have an investment in downtown. I do not, but I have lived here. I won't say exclusively because we did have a bit of a pause for a couple of years when I went to school and when I lived in Toronto in my first career, but I've lived here since 1966. I have seen the division since Bramalee was a town, Brampton was a town. I've seen the divisions in this council go on over this when my father's little building was right across the corner from it and this parking lot was taken over. To see the downtown reimagined will give cause for our downtown not to be. There is no foundation for this to exist if we are not going to give improvement. Just because you have City Hall here doesn't mean it's a good reason to do business here. Hearing from Leuna that the tunnel could be achieved with no disruptions to business, um, what's the value on that for businesses <clears throat> in the downtown? I wish I could tell you. Uh, but the ability to have business continue, and we had lots of debate through the reimagined project because there is going to be disruption simply to put sewers in. But it would not be any way to the extent of having to put through a rail line in the middle of it. Um, I can only reiterate what I have heard. Amongst the businesses, it is not a consensus. It absolutely is not a consensus because many fear for their businesses. So I can't put a value on it, Mr. Mayor. Well, I appreciate you being here today. As a, someone who's been a vocal proponent of LRT, um, to uh, express your encouragement that we, we look at this tunneling option, uh, I, I think it has a lot of weight, and thank you for being here. You're welcome. Thank you. Sorry, my apologies. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Uh, just in your presence, I would just like to ask a question of staff. Um, in the previously proposed HMLRT proposal from Metrolinx, um, Metrolinx had committed uh, as part of the cost to moving the utilities, sewer lines, water lines, anything that is that lies beneath. Um, now, in downtown Brampton, there's a bit more there. Um, 
but they had made a commitment to pay for those relocation costs. Um, if one of the primary reasons why downtown reimagined was put on hold was because here at the city we didn't have at that time um, a full grasp of what all those costs would be. Certainly we, the estimates had increased substantially from what was originally presented to members of council. Um, what opportunities are there between making choices between tunnel and surface for the costs of relocating and uh, updating the services below the street if we choose one option or the other? I hope that's not too complex a question. Just uh, thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. So, so I will uh, defer to uh, to Chris as our, our expert on, on things. But I think what what's important for council to consider. So, it, my answer will have to, out of necessity, be speculative because the province uh, in in making their metro links and making that commitment uh, was making it without uh, knowledge of the condition of the the infrastructure, the regional infrastructure for water and wastewater, and we've subsequently understand that it needs to be replaced anyway, and so um, so it is likely that they wouldn't uh, um, consider funding those portions that had to be dealt with. So. Um, so, so sorry, I, I've lost track on myself here. Uh, in terms of the the two options, I think in either case, whether it's surface or uh, tunneled, we need to replace all of that that infrastructure. In either case, we need to deal with the stormwater channel. So, I, I, you know, both of those uh, things happen, whether it's a surface or a tunnel. So, in a way, although they're co-located those issues are, are somewhat separate from the decision on the LRT. They both, both have to happen, and we've got our investigation underway on, on some of the issues that came out of the downtown reimagined that we discussed in, in uh, December. So sorry, Councillor, I'm not sure if I've covered all of the question you had or whether, Chris, there's anything else I should be adding to that. Um, I, I recall quite uh, vividly the discussion around the city over the prospect, the specter of having four years of construction. Because when we were talking about the LRT project, it was always stated as, as something that would start in 2018 and end in 2022. Um, but when the um, proponents for that plan were speaking about that timeline, that is for the construction of the entire line. So. On many occasions, downtown businesses were being told, frightened into believing that for a period of four years, the downtown would be in a state of upheaval and disruption due to construction. Um, that's not true because the project, there are multiple centers where construction is happening, but you're not gonna see construction all the time at every location along that 26 kilometer line. And in the case of Downtown Reimagined, we came to terms with the reality that because the underground services needed to be changed and were um, undertaking a, a very um, so beautiful that they works, just remind you in the I of a question. So uh, given that there is there, are we not one way or the other, whichever option we choose, the downtown will be looking at substantial work that needs to be done. And in the case of uh, downtown reimagined and a surface route, or as has been said before, LRT route, you're looking at delays or disruption to the local businesses. And either yourself, Chris, or Bruce can answer. I, I don't mind. Uh, through the chair, um, that's that's correct. I mean, there will be obviously uh, disruption to the businesses in downtown. Um, I guess in terms of the TPAP alignment, the original timing you were right. It was four years for the entire stretch. Uh, we at that time were also looking at downtown because of the businesses. 
where there's a way maybe to phase some of that work and maybe reduce so that the whole four years isn't happening right in front of downtown. Um, and certainly going forward, that's something that we could look at and try to reduce that. Um, I suspect that that might be, uh, and again, it, you've got the regional services, you've got some of the elements of downtown reimagined, and you've got uh, the LRT. So uh, the LRT itself um, might be, uh, you know, maybe you stage one block and then you go to the next block, or maybe there's some other, other ways you can stage that. But I think there are certainly some ways to try and um, maybe reduce the impacts in there, but make no mistake, there, when, you know, while we're there, uh, it's definitely going to be uh, a lot of impact, similar to downtown we imagined. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Evans. Thank you so much. Or Can I respond in any way, shape, or form Absolutely. to the chair? Uh, I'll give you that discretion. It's not normal to have that debate, but well, your passionate uh, delegation, I will allow you that. All I wanted to do was to respond to uh, Councillor Vicente. I think most of our businesses are resigned to the fact that whether it's putting a rail on the top, a pipe or a number of pipes underneath, or a tunnel underneath, we are going to be disrupted. We can debate whether it's three years, four years, or five years. We're going to be through disruption. And that cost is going to be a heavy toll on our businesses. So I go full circle and say, where is the best value at the end of that outcome? For the property owners, for the people who operate businesses, and for the citizens, not only those located around here, but those located out where I live, on the other side of the city. I still regard this as my downtown, even though I live on that other side of the 410. So I'd ask, ask again, recognize value. Not simply the time cost, not simply the monetary cost, but recognize the value that we are going to get at the end of this project. And if we do not give thorough consideration to the option of tunneling, are we going to have doubt for the rest of our lives? Great. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, members of committee, I would ask we bring staff report 8.2.1 uh, for discussion, questions, comments. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, Councillor Vicente. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, People know me quite well, and, and they know that for uh, many years um, I have been an advocate for um, LRT in the city of Brampton. In 2015, I delegated that night on behalf of uh, an organization that I was a part of, as did uh, a large number of residents, uh, downtown uh, businesses, businesses from across the city who wanted to see the city move forward. Um, we have been on this journey, believe it or not, 20 years. Would that not be correct, Chris? No. Or 10 years, this is 10 years, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, over 10 years that the city has been in discussions over how to connect our city to uh, our regional partners to the south. Um, we agreed together with Mississauga to begin doing studies um, at different points in time. Different number uh, members of council either supported or were against some of the ideas that were being discussed. Um, and it, it culminated in a decision in October of 2015, just a few weeks after the last federal election, um, to say no to the proposed route. And then this council, or the council at the time, went through, um, I think, a, quite a tumultuous period where they were looking to see how to move forward. And they were looking at um, uh, different alternatives along Main Street. They rejected those. And then they asked for consideration of alternatives along McLaughlin and Kennedy Road, and they threw in, um, almost at the last minute, a request to look at a route along the Etobicoke Creek. That resulted in a very dramatic 
uh, meeting at the TRCA in which um, the TRCA definitively stated that they would not allow um, infrastructure of that nature to course through the Etobicoke Creek Trail Park, including, at the time, they went through the additional steps of ensuring that there was no mistake, that they would not allow a surface route, they would not allow an elevated route, and they would most certainly not allow an underground route. And so then we're left with Kennedy, and we're left with McLaughlin. This report uh, that was tabled by staff and that we are considering here today proves that the decision that this council made in December to discontinue consideration of Kennedy Road and McLaughlin was the right choice. Because in both cases, according to staff, um, those routes are more appropriately served by their existing transit that they have now today or at best a zoom line and to send transit riders who are traveling directly north and south along a circuitous route to end up at the downtown Brampton GO station doesn't make sense and so we're here today with three considerations for uh, Main Street. So we have our, our, our Main Street option on the surface as originally proposed by Metrolinx. We have a variation of that which includes a loop which has some technical challenges of its own. And then of course we have the idea of tunneling uh, underground uh, under the creek uh, to the downtown which has both technical challenges in my opinion but also when I look at and listen to what Mr. Evans pointed out, what provides the best value and specifically the best value for the businesses in the downtown? Because one of the conversations we always have is that the downtown certainly is on a very busy road, a very busy highway, well frequented by 30,000 cars a day or some very high number like that. It's probably higher now than what it was when that number was first quoted. But the cars do very little to add value to the businesses that are located there. And so one of the considerations I hope that this council will consider as we go through this debate and try to find a way forward is to consider precisely what Mr. Evans has pointed out, what provides the best value to the downtown businesses, to the taxpayers, this council approved uh, for the mayor to communicate with the province and with the federal government with respect to our transit needs. And that list uh, includes over $1.1 billion in transit requests that we will need to fund over the next 10 years. So one of the choices when we talk about value is do we want to fund a 3.5 kilometer section at the cost of 1.1 to 1.7 billion dollars? Or do we want to cho choose to locate folks on a surface route which brings people to within arm's reach of the downtown businesses, does not relegate them to a subterranean option? Um, and still have the opportunity to seek additional, the, the difference to build transit all across the city of Brampton. And uh, I hope that the clerk uh, received uh, my communication from earlier today. And so I have a motion for council's consideration. And um, as I started off at the beginning of this, you all know me to be a very reasonable person and I am uh, looking forward to the discussion that will come forward from this. And so, if you allow me, Mr. Chair, I would uh, love to have the opportunity to read this motion and enter it into the record, if I may. Mr. Chair? Yes. So this motion is moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Santos. Um, whereas, the City of Brampton must consider the needs of transit riders in Brampton present and future as a priority, whereas we need to act now and build now 
Brampton needs to prioritize its projects to give confidence to its funding partners at the Government of Canada and the Province of Ontario. Whereas the Brampton Board of Trade, a key partner for the city on economic development, is recommending that the city act forthwith. Whereas the federal and provincial governments are waiting for a decision from Brampton on a preferred LRT route north of Steeles Avenue. Whereas other municipalities such as Waterloo Region, the City of Montreal, Edmonton, Calgary, Surrey and British Columbia, and the City of Ottawa are excellent examples of places that have received federal LRT funding, and in the case of the City of Ottawa, a second stage of funding to continue with multiple phases of transit expansion. Whereas the City of Brampton has advocated to the province of Ontario to open the intake for the public transit stream or PTS, for projects within the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. Whereas a public release from Metrolinx recently said that the contracts to build the Here Ontario LRT could be written in a way to allow a further extension into Brampton. Specifically, they said there are provisions in the contract language to adapt to future changes or additions to the LRT, including the completion of Mississauga City Centre Loop and or a potential extension into Brampton. Whereas Metrolinx has stated that any new changes or additions would follow the main build of the first phase and would be done according to a new schedule that will have to be agreed to with the winner of the Here Ontario contract, which they politely label Project Co. Whereas staff, the staff report did not include any information on the timing of the Here Ontario LRT financial close or outline who is funding Here Ontario LRT and who has not yet provided funding. Whereas stopping the Here Ontario LRT at a terminal on the south side of Steeles Avenue is unacceptable as it creates a safety risk for transit riders who need to transfer to and from the gateway transit terminal and make additional intersection crossings compared to if the station was on the north side. Steeles Avenue is a major corridor for trucks and trucks are banned from turning north onto Main Street from Steeles Avenue or continuing north along here Ontario Street to Main Street across Steeles Avenue. And I provided a reference to the map provided by the city. Whereas on December 12, 2018, the Downtown Reimagined project was paused, pending further work to reduce the uncertainty associated with project costs and the development of an implementation plan for the various projects in the Downtown Core. Whereas Downtown Reimagined is primarily about upgrading the underground utilities and coordinating with the Flood Protection EA, and this work would have to be delayed or the work potentially redone if a tunnel option was chosen. Whereas the streetscaping for downtown reimagined could be incorporated into the surface main LRT if funding is received before the financial close, given there would still be time to plan for it before construction commences. Whereas it should be noted that a one directional George Street LRT loop option would require an additional $50 million compared to the original Main Street LRT surface option and notably a new grade separation under the CN Halton subdivision or railway line. Whereas the original Main Street LRT surface option uses the existing underpass on Main Street and does not require an overpass or grade separation. Whereas the staff report states that the Ministry of the Environment has confirmed to Brampton staff that the original 2015 HMLRT, which includes the Main Street portion, EA and TPAP studies are still valid, whereas starting a new EA for a tunnel or loop option would cause continued delays to downtown reimagined and other various projects in the downtown core, and whereas moving forward on the surface Main Street LRT option provides certainty, will assist with the planning of Queen BRT supports the city's official plan, strategic plans, the goals of Vision 2040, and the Transit and Transportation Master Plan. Therefore, be it resolved 
that the staff report from Chris Diveston, Director of Transportation Special Projects for Public Works and Engineering, dated December 18th, to the Committee of Council meeting of April 3rd today on the Budget Amendment and Recommendation Report for the Here Ontario Main Street Light Rail Transit Extension Study and Related Transportation Initiatives for Wards 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 be received. That Recommendations 1, 4, and 5 of the Staff Report be approved. That a Here Ontario LRT stop at the Gateway Transit Terminal be constructed on the north side of Steeles Avenue as part of the Gateway Transit Terminal and that the planned LRT terminal on the southwest corner of Steeles Avenue and Main Street be relocated to the downtown Brampton terminal. That the original here Ontario Main LRT TPAP approved surface at grade routes on Main Street from Steeles Avenue to the Brampton GO station listed as option one in the staff report be selected as a preferred option. That staff and council immediately work to seek funding from the federal and provincial governments for the extension of the original here Ontario Main LRT TPAP approved surface at Great Route on Main Street from Steeles Avenue to the Brampton GO station so that it can be secured to allow for discussions with Mitchell Links and would be done according to a new schedule that would have to be agreed to with the winner of the here Ontario LRT contract. Perhaps Mr. Chair, if you could add project co there, which would be faster then waiting until a post-2021 procurement process for the tunnel or loop options. And finally, if the federal and provincial governments do not commit to funding the original here Ontario Main LRT TPAP approved surface at Great Route on Main Street from Steeles to Brampton GO Station by fall of 2019, that staff be directed to follow through with recommendations two and three of the staff report. Mr. Chair, that is the motion. I open it up to the floor for questions and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Vicente. Uh, I have Councillor Santos. Thank you, through you, Chair. So um, I, I support the motion. I think one of the things here is that this uh, motion allows us to address an immediate window of opportunity uh, for potential funding from the federal government and or provincial government. We, every single time we have met with MPs or MPPs about various projects, they've always said to us, specifically about this one, Brampton hasn't made a decision. Brampton hasn't made a decision, therefore we can't give you the funding if you haven't made a decision. So we have taken the report from staff and based on all the facts and evidence that we currently have right now, this is the most rational approach to take if we want to make sure that we are perhaps part of that phase one of this project. Anything else would potentially cause further delays, assuming that all the facts remain the same. Now, um, Rick Evans was here earlier giving the perspective of businesses. Today, we also received a letter from the Brampton Board of Trade. And I'm going to read it because they're not here to delegate, but it does have to do with economic development perspective from the Brampton Board of Trade. So it's addressed to Mayor Brown and members of council. Um, dear Mayor, Mayor, members of council, we have reviewed staff recommendations in this report and encourage council not to approve recommendation two. Instead, we encourage council to leverage the existing environmental assessment that continues to remain valid and to act forthwith to advocate that the Here Ontario light rail extension align as closely as possible with the current Metro Lynx uh, Here Ontario LRT procurement process. Bold leadership and timing is crucial. It is our understanding that the deadline for the Metrolinx RFP for the Here Ontario light rail transit project occurs this month. As such, there may be a window following the financial close to discuss the extension further into Brampton with the selected project company. Competition among municipalities for transit funding is fierce. Waiting further for study is not a winning strategy when other cities are actively advocating for shovel ready projects. The Brampton Board of Trade encourages Brampton City Council to capture this window of opportunity for the citizens of Brampton 
by taking a collaborative, proactive, and pragmatic approach to the extension of the Huron Ontario LRT further into Brampton, City Council will also enhance the probability of attracting federal and provincial financial support for the project. With the federal election scheduled this year, timing is optional. Optimal. Optimal. <laughs> the, alternative the alternative approval of staff's recommendation for further study of expensive tunneling and loops and then initiating a brand new procurement process will take years to complete waste money already spent on still valid environmental assessments, cost taxpayers even more, and delay the job creation and livability enhancements the citizens of Brampton expect and deserve. As the city's economic development marketing efforts proudly declare, Brampton is now. Acting now on extending the Huron Ontario LRT to Brampton GO Station will also add certainty to the Queen BRT and leverage Metrolinx's efforts on two-way all-day GO train service to Brampton. This certainty provides confidence that allows the business community to make decisions on investments today that accelerate Brampton's prosperity for all for generations to come. The Brampton Board of Trade encourages City Council to demonstrate bold leadership. The time is now to avoid costly delays, save money, and boost Brampton's livability, competitiveness, and job creation. By aligning with the current procurement process and securing funding for the only route with an approved environmental assessment, Council will enable the Huron Ontario Light Rail Extension Project to open as soon as possible. Signed from the CEO of the Brampton Board of Trade and the Chair of the Brampton Board of Trade. And so there is a sense of urgency to make a decision to signal. And this motion does not close the door to the tunnel. It, what this does is it just says, and it gives a certain timing in here, that we want to chase this funding. We want to be part of this window of opportunity. And if the federal government and the provincial government aren't able to come up with the funds to support what is turnkey right now, then we still have those other options to consider. And we have all the time to consider those options. So I support this motion, and I appreciate the Brampton Board of Trade the business community, Brampton Board of Trade, for providing this uh, letter to the Mayor and Council today. Thank you. Councillor Dillon. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And um, um, I do support the motion. Um, and, and, I, and I thank uh, Councillor um, Vicente for bringing it forward. Um, it's just, it's disheartening that we could, we're in this position now. Uh, some of the members of the same council, last council, voted against uh, the HMLRT, and then they vote for the HMLRT now. Um, we shouldn't be in this position, but we are in this position, and we have to make uh, the best possible choice uh, going forward. And so um, I think what this motion does uh, is it sets us on a, a course uh, to... to you know, to get a, a shovel-ready project, to get to, uh, discussions going on, um, on on potential funding from the province and the federal government. Right now, uh, the City of Toronto, uh, I believe either today or uh, yesterday, passed uh, a motion to uh, uh, go forth with a certain route and also ask the federal government for funding. And so we're not doing anything different than any other municipality. But uh, I think what we have to do now is finally move forward, make a decision, uh, but that does not rule out uh, other options as well. And so we'll still uh, take a look at, or have the study commence eventually for the, um, for the tunnel. Um, as per the tunnel, um, it, it's, uh, I believe in 2015, we were looking close to half a billion dollars. I'm sure uh, it's even more than that now. Uh, and it, it's from, Steels to downtown Brampton. I don't know if that's the best uh, investment uh, or use of money. Uh, if you take a look at the east of Brampton, um, we still uh, are underserved. And, um, you know, almost a billion dollars uh, it's going to be costing us for this short route. And if we go uh, underground, it necessarily isn't the best for business, in my opinion. I think having a surface route uh, would be best. Uh, you, you get the customers directly to 
um, and you get exposed to the to the businesses and you get exposure to the businesses uh, as well and so uh, I'm really tired of listening to a lot of the uh, justifications for for different routes I think this is the best route it's been studied uh, we've heard a lot about um, personality of uh, uh, Main Street I don't think anything uh, is gonna take away from it we've heard about culture we've heard about uh, the business is being affected, but we need to make a decision now to move our city forward. We've been handcuffed uh, by the decision by last council. Uh, so we need to move forward. We need to put our foot down uh, and finally make a decision. And so I think this is the best plan. Uh, I think uh, what, what it does is puts, in a, puts us in a position to uh, request uh, the federal government, especially it's an election year, uh, to, to get us that money, just like other municipalities have. Uh, but uh, I'm eager to hear uh, what uh, the thoughts of uh, the rest of council is. Thank you, Council uh, Mayor Brown. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I would say, uh, first of all, um, I think we need more information on who the financing uh, partners are before we proceed. So um, I hope that there'll be a motion coming. Uh, for us to do that additional due diligence. Uh, uh, but before that motion comes, I would say uh, that <clears throat> I can't support this motion. Uh, it contains elements in the motion that are factually uh, incorrect. Um, and uh, I don't want to be uh, dishonest with the, with, with the public. And um, you know, whether it's saying that uh, um, a tunneling would de delay the downtown reimagined, um, we've now heard from staff that the, the, it would be the surface route that would, in fact, uh, uh, be in contradiction with the efforts of downtown reimagined. Um, I've been working on federal and provincial support for this. There is none at this point for this surface option. Uh, I believe that we can achieve funding for um, a tunnel. And so if this motion is going to be passed, um, I can't be part of it because I know it's going to be unsuccessful, um, that it's not going to meet with a success. There's, I've, I've reached out to um, other partners and they have said that they're not a part of this. And so if you set a deadline for them, uh, we were anticipating them to fail. I don't think that's fair to our, 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 our partners. Having said that, at least that we will get a move beyond this, at least that we can focus on getting down to work. I, rather than wait till the fall to get down to work, I'd love to get down to work right away on, on, on getting the LRT to the downtown. Uh, but uh, if we need to go through an exercise for people to feel confident, um, I, I just, I don't want further delays and, and that's why I, I, I don't want to set false expectations that, that there's some magic pot out there um, that's going to support this. And, and frankly, we can't ignore the advice of our own staff. You pass a motion and say there's no problems with downtown reimagined um, when their own staff are saying that there are complications. You say that the EA is perfect for our own staff are saying there's complications. Uh, um, we have great staff at the city of Brampton, and to not not consider their responses, not consider their input, um, would be a waste of the great resources we have here at the city of Brampton. Now, I'd love to say that it's summer, 12 months a year, but you just can't say it and, and make it make it true. Um, the reality is, facts matter, and what we've heard on this discussion um, is inconsistent with the motion um, from the city of Brampton staff. It's inconsistent. Uh, what we heard today from the downtown business community, from uh, what we heard from Leona, the biggest proponents of the LRT before. And I don't want to go back to the rhetoric that happened a few years ago. Um, I'm glad that chapter is over for, for the city. Um, it, it, we certainly don't want that rhetoric to be part of the discussion today now, or at least all on the same page, that we want to see modern transit into the downtown. I thought we got off to a great start in December saying that we wanted, wanted modern transit. And frankly... You know, a letter was quoted from the Board of Trade. Uh, I called the Board of Trade, and they just said, was ever faster. They were under the false impression that the surface route was faster. But we've now heard that that may not be the case, that we can't even give a timeline of how long the surface route would take, whether it's one year, six years, eight years, we don't know, because we all know about the complications of downtown reimagined and what's there. That complication is still there. And so... Obviously, we need to do some more due diligence. Uh, there needs to be more uh, information. We need to look at the, uh, the financing partners. I'm hoping a member of, of council will put forward a motion that we actually do the due diligence 
and that as soon as possible, I want to go after this funding, I want to make this happen, we can make the tunnel option work, we can get the funding, um, and I hope that uh, whatever charades we have to go through before we get to there, they can be, that window can be as short as possible so we can get down to work. I want to see this happen in our time in, in, in public service. I want to see this happen while we're all still involved in, in, in Brampton um, public service. I, I don't want this to be waiting for seven or eight years because of the complications we have there. Everyone says, hey, you heard from, Le from Leuna, you don't regret a greater investment down the road. You, you don't regret investing in public transit. Um, we got to get this right, and uh, if that means we need a few more weeks to uh, make sure that members of council who have doubts on the viability of the tunnel to get that information, then let's take those few weeks to make sure that we can alleviate those concerns. We've got dance partners. We've got potential uh, partnerships with one and we've got nothing with the other and the notion that we would chase the one where there's no partners for me would be uh, wasted time and energy for the city of Brampton uh, that I don't want to be party to and that's why I can't support it. Uh, thank you Mayor Brown. Councilor Fortini. Thank you, Chair. So, the last uh, council I did support the LRT and I think it's a great project for everyone but hearing the people to come to delegate Think, uh, they don't it's going to be five years of construction. And I've seen the LRT done on St. Clair. All the businesses are going to suffer one way or another. It's not something that's going to be done overnight. Uh, I think there's a lot of moving parts to this. I think maybe we could kind of defer it for two weeks to get more information maybe before uh, April 17th or May 1st to get more information. Two weeks is not going to hurt. Uh, and see what we could come up with. Uh, I'm in favor of the motion. I'm in favor of the LRT underground or above ground. I want the transit. I need the, we need the jobs. And uh, I know through my experience, regardless if it's a tunnel, digging two holes, it's a lot that won't disrupt the, uh, the businesses, but it's still going to disrupt when you start doing all the water mains and all. One way or another, you're digging 16 feet deep for the sewers there. Uh, so let's defer this maybe uh, for two weeks, so the 17th or May 1st, the next committee, and we'll get maybe more information and see what we can do then. And we'll have to make a final decision then. Thank you, Councilor Partini, a voice of reason. <laughs> we have a deferral. Uh, oh, okay, so I'll move to Councilor Pileshi. Deferral. So, it, thank you, Mr. Chair. It does feel like Groundhog Day. Um, on behalf of Councillor Fortini, I would like to move a deferral based on his comments to April or May and uh, try and get, uh, I'm not going to add any mediation this time, um, but I'm going to move the deferral that Councillor Fortini, unfortunately, had spoken to, so couldn't move it. So I support my uh, Colleague. Thank you, Councillor Pileshi. Uh, Councillor Santel speaking to the deferral. No, you can't speak to a deferral. No, sorry. Can't speak to, can't speak to a deferral. Oh, you can't speak. Also, it's referred. My deferred? It's a deferral. Through you, Mr. Chair. I, so, a deferral has been properly placed. Okay. Uh, under Council's procedural rules, we proceed to a vote immediately. Okay. And just for clarification, there were two dates mentioned, so we need clarity on the date for the deferral. Is it the deferral of May 1st or? So through, through the chair, um, to prevent a walk-on report, given the importance of this issue, we would greatly appreciate, of the two options, May 1st. Okay, okay working together is the Can spirit. I have a question about <laughs> Councillor the Dillon. So the motion Can on the I floor is to defer, including the correspondence that's with this item on the staff report. To May 1st. To May 1st. About the, about the deferral, may I ask a question? Yes. Do the no. chair. Uh, I will. Okay, but I think he just wants clarification, clarification of what we're on voting the, on. No, I want clarification on the deferral. With the deferral, does uh, staff take any comments under consideration? Or is there any direction for that in a deferral? Or is it simply just deferring this for... Uh, a month or so. Through you, Mr. Chair, the deferral was without conditions. 
So the whole matter is being deferred. It's just being postponed for for four weeks to May 1st. And if staff think that it's appropriate to bring back a report to complement this report when it comes back, then staff can do that. The question I have, though, is is it more appropriate to have a referral? So a deferral, can it have certain stipulations in there for them to uh, bring information back or to take, thing, take their comments uh, or take direction, certain direction? Through you, Mr. Chair, a deferral can include conditions. In this case, it has not. So perhaps um, if I can ask just uh, around the table even, if there's any type of amendment we can have for the staff to come back with specific information, including funding options. Well, that's what we're so we want to just make sure that that's so, so to this clear with them. So to the city manager, would it be fair at this stage for the deferral that if any councillors around the table would like some issue addressed within the report that they write, uh, I guess, the Commissioner of Public Works? To the chair, we would greatly appreciate that clarity around those conditions so that we ensure the report that we bring back satisfies those conditions. So are we clear members of... Uh, committee okay we have excuse me okay we have right now uh, speaking to the deferral Councilor Santos I believe would like there's no speaking to the deferral but before there's a point of order by Councilor Santos I will accept that point of order um, just for clarification in terms of what we are deferring are we deferring this motion or are we deferring the report what are we deferring through you, Mr. Chair, the deferral is in three parts. It's this motion, it's the staff report, and it's the correspondence from the Board of Trade. Okay. Those are the three substantive items before. And the Thank date you. is for May 1st? Yes. Okay. And members of the committee, again, if any further issues, comments, or anything you want to see addressed in the report, uh, let's say the Commissioner, so to avoid, and he will speak to Chris. Okay. All in favor? Sorry? Oh, we have Councillor Fortini has a, do you want to say point of order? Scream it out. Mine was mostly about see how we can work on finance part, who's going to work on the parts. Okay, that's fine. Thank you, Councillor Fortini. We've registered that. Uh, all in favor to, for deferral? Okay, carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Yes. wanted everyone to know I'm not uh, disagreeing for a, a, a purpose that's not a, important to the city. Thank you, Mayor, for uh, the information. So um, I believe now do I invite the chair of the respective area to come forward? Oh, we have one more delegation. Oh, yes, Sylvia Roberts regarding transit storage facility. Hello, that was lots of fun. Uh, my name is Sylvia, I'm a resident of Ward 3. So before you there is a staff report uh, you'll be dealing with it soon. There's a confidential portion which you'll deal with any camera items later. The report is substantially same, similar to one delivered in May. There's paragraphs that are literally identical to it. And so in May of last year, there are portions that made sense, but with now information we have now from 2018, they no longer make sense. We have a five-year plan for transit uh, for 2018 to 2022. The ridership data projected that our actual results from 2018 are actually higher than our projected numbers for 2022 of the five-year plan. So if we're that far off there, and if you look at the ridership per capita, it's 50 per capita which is where we expect it to be by 2022. So that's by the end of a five-year plan. So I'm not sure how useful that report, that um, plan is going to be for projecting out another five years, if in some portions it's already off by 400%. Um, there's also the 2015 transit master plan. And 
for those data, if we look at our AM peak, which is what that study is on, we're actually where we were planning to be in early to mid 2020s. So if we're looking at that data and saying, well, we're not gonna need one to the 2030s, well, we're halfway there in terms of ridership. So my concern is that it says that a fourth one isn't going to be necessary until 2031 or later, but based on our current ridership data, we could be needing it within 10 years, or at least to begin procurement. If we start looking at it now, it gives us better options on where to look, because there's large portions of the city on the fringes where we had been looking for a site that had not been developed. If we have Realty looking at it over this period, we can make sure to find a site that is appropriate, that represents what we want. The city doesn't seem to have issues with holding properties for 20 years to do a land swap. So I think if you buy a property that's prepared with specifications from transit, those will still be valid in five, year, five years down the line, even if the numbers which seem to be wildly off do turn out to be accurate. If you look at transit ridership growth in the city, we're not the, so um, a lot of our data is based on other cities, but like with previous comments on benchmarking, Brampton doesn't really represent other cities. If you look at population, we have a much larger, younger population. So for most of you, you remember a time when the roads were nowhere near as congested as it is now. I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say many residents of Brampton regard rush hour commute in Brampton as basically hell for 30 minutes or more. So if you look at young people, driving has never actually been particularly appealing. If you look at our car insurance rates, you all know about it. I'm sure you hear about it at least once a month on that. So the financial costs are so high and the value is not there. If you talk to most people under 40, plenty of us are happy to get rid of our car because it's just not worth it. The transit system is substantially improving at a very rapid pace. And so the reality is, Ridership growth is only constrained by how much you want it to grow, as expressed in putting your money where your mouth is. Because a lot of people have said they're for transit, but you still need to put the money there. So my concern is that you're going to need to look at, it specifically the section where it says you're not gonna need the fourth one until 2031, somewhere between 2031 and 2040. I would like council to have staff start looking at procuring a site sooner than that because it's the overall facility is very expensive, but the portion that's the land is a much smaller portion of that. And it's well, the city has tens of millions of dollars easily that you're waiting to swap for someone at some point eventually for some project that you don't know. So procuring something that you know you're going to need and you're gonna be getting it within 10 years of when you are going to need it does not seem that reasonable. Yeah, that's my delegation, sorry. Questions regarding this delegation? Seeing none, can I get a motion to receive the yeah receive the delegation? Uh, Councilor Pileshi, all those in favor? Okay, motion is moved. Thank you very much. And now we will move on to the economic development and culture section. Um, seeing that there's no staff presentations for section 6.1, seeing that there's no reports for 6.2 or other business for 6. Point, oh, we do have an update in 6.3 on innovation of post-secondary matters. Oh, there is no update, okay. Okay, all right. Going to 6.4 and seeing no correspondence. Do any counselors have any questions? Seeing none. Uh, public question period, is there any questions from the public? Seeing none, uh, we will move on to corporate services. So for seeing that we have no staff presentation reports I move on to 7.2.1 oh we dealt with that okay uh, now we'll move on to section 7.2.2 uh, and uh, it's a staff report on the amendments of Brampton uh, appeal tribunal bylaw uh, 48-2008 uh, do any members have questions or comments uh, the clerk would like to say something uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this report was prepared um, with a proposal to um, combine the Brampton Appeal Tribunal and the Property Standards Committee, given some issues that are outlined in the report. And the, um, 
the nature of both those committees are very similar. However, since Council um, has conducted its uh, interviews and made appointments to both of those committees separately to continue them mm -hmm. operating separately, um, my advice at this point would be that to, to perhaps refer this report back to staff. Um, there are some housekeeping amendments that uh, we need to make to the bylaw to keep them separate, mm -hmm. and we'll report back on that. So there sure. is a motion that uh, okay. put on the screen. Okay. So I, I see no questions. Uh, Councillor Pleshi would like to put, uh, put a motion to refer this back to staff. Uh, all those in favor? Okay, that is approved. Moving on to section 7.2.3, which is a staff report regarding the flight policy. Okay, I, I actually have questions on this one. Uh, so are we getting, uh, okay, seeing no presentation, I just wanted to, um, there's staff members from the, Teresa's here? Okay, I see her. So I just had, uh, nobody else has any questions? Going once? Okay, can the chair be heard? Thank you. Um, first of all, for 5.1.1 community flag raising, 7.2.3-10. dash <laughs> I'll give you a second. Yeah, uh, section E, should a community flag uh, raising is requested, I think it should be B requested, just for uh, thing, and just for clarification. And um, for um, section uh, G, uh, I, uh, so I see the city will fly flags on the community flagpole of nations. I, I know we make uh, an exception for heritage months, uh, heritage groups, is that correct? So should we be clear and say of nations or heritage groups? Because there's many heritage groups that aren't nations. So through the chair, to the chair. We wanted a policy that allowed um, clear criteria, mm -hmm. but that did, um, understanding the cultural mosaic of our community, that when there are groups that have flags that are organizational flags or, or cultural heritage flags, if they don't qualify under B, so of organizations, so for with the example of um, Hindu heritage or Sikh heritage, yeah. that could be understood as an organizational flag. And in the report, I did note that the, the culture of our community would be allowing of those flags. The, re the policy does have an approval process in there that if something doesn't uh, meet the criteria in the policy, we would come back to council. So there would still be decision making that rests with council to, to make those decisions. Okay, so w what we're saying is we will let heritage groups fly their flags. Okay, I see Councilor Bowman has a question. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. And sorry, Teresa, I should have asked this when we met yesterday on this, uh, it, it, it slipped my mind. When we have things like Heritage Months, Hindu Heritage Month, for example, how is the decision, if there's, if there's like five different groups perhaps involved in that month, how are we making the decision what flag goes up if each of the five groups may have their own uh, heritage flag, for example? So great question, Councillor, through the chair. We did allow in the policy, so the, the two points that do speak to that are number one, the policy does say that it's first come, first serve. So uh, because we do want to have some criteria, that being said, we understand that there are times when there'll be groups that we want to work together. Uh, and we've had a number of consultations on this with the mayor's office. And we've actually added a section that does say that the city would, it, somewhere here, but. Um, Part N, that's on the screen. And yes. Thank you. So when the same flag is requested, the city will make an effort to coordinate those requests so that we, we want to be collaborative and we want groups to work together. Um, and so for the majority of cases, we believe that we would be able to facilitate that. Okay. I, I, and thank you very much through you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm more speaking of when different flags are presented mm. during the same month by different groups mm. all celebrating that same month. How do we determine or what do we do in that case? So at this point in time, I don't have an example of that happening. If it were to happen, the, we could the, allow uh, different Black days. Heritage Month, for example. Black History Month. Okay, so in that month, this sorry, year, we, Black had, History, sorry. Yeah, we had one flag request, but we could have allowed uh, multiple days in that month. So we could allow, so the policy is allowing a flag to fly on the community flagpole for two weeks. So we could allow a shared 
time. If, if a group is celebrating throughout a month or a day or a week, we would allow through the policy a shared amount of time for those groups. So we would want to facilitate the multiple flags to, to be flown. So the spirit of this policy is to allow m the, the majority of groups and, uh, to celebrate their their heritage and their culture and their cause. Okay, and sorry, just one more question through you, Mr. Chair. Yep. What are other cities doing, like us flying flags for, say, two weeks at a time, is that consistent with what other cities like Mississauga, for example, do, or do they have different time limits where the flag is, is at mast? So through the chair, um, the majority of major Canadian cities, so um, Ottawa, Toronto, Mississauga, they fly for one day. Currently, the city of Brampton, without a policy, our procedure has been to fly flags for a month. Uh, you'll note in the report, going back 10 years, there was maybe one to three flag raisings a year. We're now mm -hmm. seeing we're up to, I think, 25 yeah. as of today. Yeah. Um, so what I did in the spirit of that, knowing where Brampton was and where we are now, I, I reduced it to two weeks. Um, just given the number that we have, if we continue to receive more in, in the spirit of equity and fairness, and we would need to maybe look at reducing that as our colleagues have done in other cities. Okay, so the, the, the potential for possibly reducing that as we get more and more, which is fantastic. I, I love the fact that we're doing more. Um, it, it may become uh, a less uh, amount of time, like maybe a day, two days. Right, or okay. two in a day. Yeah, oh great. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right. Seeing that there is also two recommendations, can I get a motion to approve the recommendations? Uh, we've got Councillor Willens. All those in favor? All right. That is carried. Uh, moving on to 7.3, there's no new business. No 7.4. Uh, 7.5, Councillor's question period. Do any councillors have any questions? Seeing none. Section 7.6, public question period. Um, Sylvia, I see you. <laughs> Sorry, this is just a brief question. My name is Sylvia. I'm resident of Ward 3. My question was on certain flags such as Autism Ontario and how they interact with the whole national flag policy. Yep. Given that that was just like yesterday. Through you, Mr. Chair. So the, the way the policy is designed, it, it, uh, it allows for the flying of national flags as well as flags of causes for organizations that meet the criteria. Okay. All right. Seeing no other questions in public question period, I will move on to uh, public works. Uh, seeing no staff presentations, moving on to reports. Uh, for s yeah. for uh, E.2.1, we have a report on budget amendment. Oh, it's deferred? Oh, yes, it was. Yes. All right, that was deferred earlier. Um, seeing no other new business and no co no correspondence. Section 8.5, councillors' questions. Through you, Mr. Chair. Counselors? Sorry, 8.2.5 was uh, removed from consent by Councillor Williams and then released, but uh, it's still before committee to okay. deal with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just moved it. Okay, so we have a motion. Okay, so we have a motion by uh, Councillor. Uh, Williams to uh, approve the recommendations again. Yep. Thank you. All right, that passes. Uh, seeing no other new business. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, we have uh, the minutes to be approved. They're approved on consent. Uh, seeing no correspondence, section 8.5, councillors' question period. Do any councillors have any questions? Seeing none. Section 8.6, any members of the public? See you nodding, Sylvia. Thank you. This section uh, nine. We're moving on to community service sec section uh, nine point one. Staff presentations. Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to reports. Uh, we see section nine point two point one. Uh, we have a report on a need for a third transit maintenance and storage facility. To staff, have any comments to make? Seeing none. Well, no, just wonder. All right, seeing none. Can I get a motion to receive the report? Oh, Councillor Vicente. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a question to staff. The delegation today raised some questions about um, uh, this particular re report. Uh, can you just summarize for us um, what staff will be doing to address the concerns raised by the delegation? 
So through the chair, um, the comments that the delegation has made refer to uh, the growth that we've been experiencing in the last two or three years and how we would accommodate that growth moving forward in future years and whether um, you know, the urgency of a fourth facility is identified by the transportation master plan. Staff taking that back and, and the majority of our growth, um, large majority of our growth has happened during off-peak hours, um, which means that we don't require a huge amount of buses for that, which which dedicates to, or predicts a need for more facilities to accommodate those vehicles. What I will say is that the last two or three years have been an anomaly in terms of our ridership growth. We are, we are confident that that will not continue at that rapid pace. Um, our, our, our business plan, our five-year business plan, we are retooling, but the majority of it we still feel very confident in, and uh, we feel that the trending is starting to flat out again to what we would expect. So the other parts too that um, that I just want to touch on is through, you know, through the expansion and the growth of transit. One of the big key components here that we have to keep in mind is uh, the expected growth in active transportation is growing at a much rapid rate um, than our growth in, in transit. So we are looking at deflecting some of our um, pressures through um, automation of vehicles, through transportation network companies, i.e., TNCs, um, and, and other type of uh, disruptors as we call them in transportation. So also in, in, in coupling to the comments that were made about the LRT today, uh, some of those assets are going to be deflected as well. So we're fairly confident that um, that our projections right now where we're at in getting a third facility in the start of the new decade are still on track with uh, our help from Commissioner Menace's group. And then the fourth facility is still under review, but we feel fairly confident that the, the size of the third facility will accommodate our third growth. But after we do a bit of a further review into our ridership trends and the anomaly that we experienced last three years, we'll make a more definitive uh, recommendation at that time. So thank you, Alex, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, is the summary then that it's staff's view that a fourth facility may not be necessary then in the future to accommodate all of our vehicles? And through the chair, that's our intent, is uh, we're building the third facility large enough and um, to accommodate what we feel is going to be our full growth in our city. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you all. Any other questions? Seeing none, can I get a motion to receive this report? Councillor Vicente, all those in favor? Okay, that is moved. Um, okay, so I see section 9.2.2 was uh, addressed in consent and approved. So I will move on to 9.3, other new business. Those minutes were also approved in consent. Yep, uh, councillor question period 9.5. Do any councillors have any questions? Seeing none. Uh, public question period, I think we have, yep, we have a question. So on the transit facility, while the numbers are anomalous for the rest of the country, it's not actually anomalous for Brampton. Between 2010 and 2012, we actually had similar amounts of growth. What happens is we add a large amount of capacity. The service expansion drives growth. It hits maximum capacity. It becomes unreliable. People stop taking transit, which help it divert some people away from it, like you see in a blackout where it becomes unreliable. Then we start building up buses again. You get a larger increase, and then you get the same pattern appear. So again, it's like with benchmarking. It's so. It was said to be anomalous, but this has happened exactly in Brampton before. And it's also was said that most of the growth is in off-peak periods, and this is true, but between 2012 and 2018, based on the city's own documents, peak rider, or sorry, AM ridership, which is what the 2015 Transit Master Plan talked about, grew by 8.5%. If we grow by 6%, we will exhaust the capacity. So. How is that? How is that going to be addressed? If we hit only three quarters of what we've been averaging historically for growth in that period, so I think your question is how that will be addressed, correct? Yes. So, do you have any comments? On yeah, that? through the chair, certainly. Um, 
I guess during the 2010, 2012 period, we anticipated the growth because of our launches of our Zoom services and the, the amount of service that we put out with the um, with our bus rapid transit network. So that was um, more or less calculated in terms of what our growth was expected, and that helped us get the funding and, and the analysis that was done afterwards uh, proved to be successful, and we exceeded some of the numbers that were initially projected. When we look at the more recent growth, and I think uh, you know through the chair uh, to the delegate. I think if I'm if I'm understanding correctly, the delegate is talking about um, uh, the the ridership, and I think there was a reference to a comment of the 47,000. Those were were boardings, and without getting too technical, we'd be more than happy to sit down with the delegate uh, at, at a meeting to discuss this further. Um, those are boardings. When you actually look at the ridership, which we regard as the revenue rises around 37,000, so we're well within what we feel is appropriate. Um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, we don't want to slow down our increase in, in ridership growth, but we are trying to do a balance, which I think is a comment on us to make sure that we run effectively and efficiently in our community as well. How are there plans for demographic shifts? So currently the primary core of the ridership is in the below 30 demographic, but as long as the system remains reliable and given how ridiculous car insurance is here, people are continue taking the bus. So as you transition, you're gonna be moving from people who were taking it to high school and then were taking it to college and now they're getting older and they're getting into the workforce and they'll be taking them to their nine to five jobs, which is going to increase your pressure on the AM ridership. How is long-term demographic shifts? Because we're talking about 10 years out, so I believe this would be considered medium or at least longer term. How are we accounting for those demographic shifts in our ridership base? So through the chair, when we look at our demographics, I mean, clearly in the last several years with the spike we saw in our ridership, we attributed to several factors. Um, some of those factors being our student ridership, the economic growth in our community. Um, other factors, too, that uh, our community has are multi-unit dwellings, whether they're unknown or unregistered. But we have a, a huge spike in that, and that's reflective in some of our, in, in some of our growth. We clearly, the younger demographics... Uh, clearly like to use transit, but that's not just within our community, that's within every community. Um, but clearly we, we anticipate that we feel we are on track in terms of our future growth, but we are going to be doing a deeper dive into understanding some of the trends and, and our future trends to ensure that our services meet the demand. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, seeing no other public questions, uh, we move on to the referred matters list, where a copy of the current referred matters list for council and its committees including original updated reporting dates is publicly available on the city's website. Moving on to section 11, government relations. Uh, we were all given uh, the update for government relations. Is low, low here? Okay, that's okay. So I move on to public question period. Is there any pub questions for the public? Seeing none, I guess we move on to closed uh, section where we will be discussing section 13.1, which is a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board, and section 13.2, which is a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. And Chair, there is there was a third item added, 13.3. Uh, okay. It's a uh, Security of the property of the municipality or local board and a position plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the municipality or local board. Okay. And so we will be um, discussing those three sections in closed session. Thank you. Yeah. Recess for five minutes? Ten. Ten. Okay. We also have a request to recess for ten minutes. Uh, that passes unanimously. Okay. <laughs> Upstairs. Okay. going to get started uh, in closed section, uh, section 13.1.
uh, which was a proposal pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. Uh, one recommendation was approved, and we have three for uh, public session coming on the screen shortly. Okay. Oh, two. Correct. Okay. So we have two recommendations uh, to be considered public. Any questions? No. Could I get a motion to approve them? Uh, Councillor Vicente, all those in favor? Okay. Motion carries. Uh, for 13.2, uh, proposal pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board, uh, direction was given. And for 13.3, which was, if the clerk could help me out. 13.3 was security of the property of the municipality or local board and a position plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the municipality or local board. Okay, and this was also... Um, Refer to, to council, council next week. Yeah. Okay, and uh, seeing that we're done with closed session, uh, next section is 14. Adjournment. Can I have a motion sure. to adjourn? Councillor Willens, all those in favor? And we are adjourned. Thank you.